Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on this newly cold day. <laughs> so is, is the live stream started as well? Great. Okay. Hello, live stream folks. Welcome. So there are many of us in the room today, but there are also many people signed up online to watch this seminar. Not all of the talks will be videotaped, um, but a lot of them will, and the introduce the People doing the introductions will let you know ahead of time um, which talks will be eligible for the CME credits and which talks will be available on the live stream. My name is Kathy Klapperich. I'm the director of the Center for Future Technologies in Cancer Care here at Boston University. We are a center funded by the NIBIB out of NIH. And our function is um, largely to focus on the identification uh, the identif the identification, uh, prototyping, and early clinical assessment of new technologies in cancer care. We look at screening, we look at monitoring, we look at treatments, um, and we're looking mainly at technologies that are ready to make that jump from the laboratory um, to the bedside. In order to do that, we um, fund studies in clinical needs assessment to look at where new technologies may be best deployed. We also um, fund a lot of prototyping activities, both on the very small scale, which we call alpha prototyping, which largely happens in this building and at the Epic Center um, down the street, and a little bit in some BSL-2 facilities um, in the College of Engineering. And also larger scale prototyping activities, which we call beta prototyping activities, which are, are funded by us and take place in the Fraunhofer Center for Manufacturing Innovation just across the street from this building. So our, but our larger center functions also include training, and this is one of the uh, major training activities that we do each year, which is, um, which has previously had a name which I won't remember, and so I won't repeat, <laughs> because I always get it wrong. But we, we've changed the name um, to include the term um, non-specialists. So really, um, the function of this meeting is to bring new, exciting, emerging topics to folks who are non-specialists in the field, meaning we're either trained as engineers or, or basic scientists in another field. And so there are people here who are students, um, undergraduates, graduate students, people from industry. Um, I see many uh, fellow faculty and also clinicians in the audience. And we have um, similar folks um, joining us online, um, more from industry online because they have a little bit of a harder time getting out of work to, to come here. So we do uh, a number of different activities um, during the year. And um, the next one will be our annual science meeting, which we usually have here, and usually focuses entirely on point of care technologies and cancer care that we fund. However, this year we're opening up, the, me the meeting is opening up to the entire point of care technology network, which consists of our center, a center at Johns Hopkins University focused on sexually transmitted infections, and a center at CIMIT here in Boston that's focused on point of care technologies in primary care. And the three centers are coming together in Washington, D.C. in June to have our annual science symposium. And so for the people that are in the room and the people that are on the live stream, I believe that meeting will also be live streamed and then archived online as well. So now I'm going to hand it over to um, Bennett Goldberg, who is the director of the training corps in the Center for Future Technologies and Cancer Care, and he's going to run the rest of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I know I shouldn't sound so shocked to hear that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to go through a couple of other things um, about what we do in training in the uh, in the training core for the uh, CFTCC. Um, we've had a variety of things like regulatory workshops trying to, again, largely for the non-specialists so that they can become more familiar with what the FDA um, um, drug and device uh, applications look like. Um, again, that's archived for people who want to ac access it. I would say that overall the education and training activities are really around three ideas um, to deliver up-to-date information about cancer care and especially challenges uh, and technology advancements, right? Um, uh, change happens because you have uh, opportunity, ability, and motivation. And part of that is an educational process. And so we hope to deliver good information about that. 
Uh, another thing in the opportunity space is the connections that can be made between clinicians, researchers, scientists, and engineers. We have good evidence over the past decade of collaborative networks that have been developed that bringing people together on a regular basis, creating common languages, having people struggle with their ideas around, uh, around change and around um, certain technologies or challenge problems does lead to greater collaboration, more innovation, and more success. Um, our particular focus is on um, M Health and point of care instrumentation, as well as improvements to existing or developing new diagnostic tools. So that's the, the role of the training core in the CFTCC program. Um, today's uh, group is an is a, is excellent lineup of speakers. Our, our, our keynote speaker will be uh, right after lunch, Dr. Gottwals. And then we have a group of, uh, of excellent speakers covering a range of things, looking at new directions especially in immunotherapy and resistance to therapy in cancer care. So I'm glad that you're all here and that the uh, millions listening online are also here to uh, join us in today's activities. Um, I would say just as a general rule, I think that uh, we will have definitely time for questions. I recommend people jot questions down on, on note papers. They listen to the talks. Uh, and then we'll have a good discussion um, afterwards and certainly at lunch and, and during the breaks. Um, looking ahead, there's a couple more things in the training core coming along. Uh, at, we've done a variety of hackathons over the years. The next hackathon is part of CAMTECH. Um, CAMTECH is an interesting group that's called the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technologies, and they do a lot of work in Africa, and in particular, um, developing point-of-care technologies in um, sub-Saharan and resource-limited settings. So there's a hackathon together with CAMTECH that will be happening in February at Mass General Hospital. There's the annual science meeting that Kathy pointed out in June, and we have another regulatory workshop coming up in the fall of this coming year. So just keep, keep your eyes glued to the website, and those events will be uh, listed. Or um, I think you can follow a hashtag or something like that. So, now, those are the things that are um, looking ahead. Um, one quick thing, because we are providing CME credits for those who've done this before, you know there's a requirement to fill out the surveys. Um, that way we can really have uh, some sense of what you got out of it, and that's part of the process to provide cr CME credits. So that's a everyone must fill out a survey um, at the end of the workshop. And so please do so and hand it in either at the front desk or with the people that are uh, um, really responsible for putting this together, Lena Liu and, uh, and, uh, and, and Helen Fawcett um, and Mario Cabodi, who have been part of this team that's been developing this with Kathy and me and Stefan Anderson over the past um, several months. Um, you have to, uh, to receive the CME credit, also turn in the request form, and we can't accept surveys after the close of workshop. These are all CME rules. So if you, um, the, the surveys and the form are in your folder. Right, okay, good. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us about that. Oh, uh, Helen is now displaying the form. <laughs> um, so we're not going to this right yet. And so uh, I am going to I'm going to now introduce our uh, first speaker. Are your slides up here, Lee? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I have to get my glasses. <laughs> Are they on the desktop, Helen or Lena? Yeah, you guys are bringing up the slides. Oh, they bring them up from up here? So you don't advance them here? Okay. So I'd like to introduce, okay. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to introduce Lee Tang. Uh, Lee Tang received his PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in material science and engineering in 2012. And he's recently been the Irvington postdoctoral fellow in, uh, in Dr. Irvine's lab at the Koch Institute at MIT. Um, we're also happy to announce that he will be joining 
um, EPFL in Switzerland in bioengineering in a tenure track professorship in uh, August. And of course, we wish him well on his uh, budding career. And we're excited to hear from him about how he looks at immune systems using smart biomaterials. Please welcome Lee Tang. Started, I just wanted to uh, say for the folks on the live stream, you'll notice that last speaker is now the first speaker. Um, the first speaker is ill, Should and fine? he wasn't able to right. attend, and yeah. we just unfortunately found out about it late last night. So what we've done in, in modifying the schedule is Lee agreed to fill in the first spot and, and speak first, and the rest of the schedule is exactly the same, just so everyone, everyone knows and is on the same page. I forgot to make that announcement. Sure. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Goldberg and uh, uh, Cabridge for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you for all, organize, all the organizers for the opportunity to speak here in the, this workshop. It, um, good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure uh, to share with you about some of our understanding of cancer immunotherapy and uh, how we as an engineer to attempt to uh, tackle some of the issues in cancer immunotherapy using biomaterial engineering strategies. So as an engineer, I first learned the power of cancer immunotherapy from a story of this little girl, Emily. She was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia when she was only uh, five years old, unfortunately. Um, her doctor treated her normally as the, uh, used the chemo, uh, chemotherapeutics. However, she relapsed uh, quick shortly after that and uh, she try, her doctor tried another round of chemo, and uh, she just relapsed faster and faster each time. Her daughter, uh, at that time, ran out of any weapon in the fight with cancer. Refused to give up, her parents decided to enroll her in a very new clinical trial to using the tumor-specific T cells to fight the leukemia in her body. That clinical trial was led by Professor Carl Jung, U University of uh, Pennsylvania. After she received this uh, T cell-based uh, immunotherapy, the miracle happened. Only about one week later, all the cancer cells are gone in her body. And she remained complete remission and cancer-free for one year, two years, and now uh, at least more than uh, three years now. And she lives a very happy and healthy life, just like um, all the other little girls. From this very exciting re uh, clinical result, I start to learn that cancer immunotherapy could really uh, cure some of the difficult cancers which no longer respond to the standard therapies. So nowadays, cancer immunotherapy become a really hot topic, and we hear many people talking about cancer immunotherapy and getting very excited. I think one of the most important reasons is that this therapy can indeed improve the long-term survival of the patient. As shown in this uh, survival curve, showing the percentage of the survival patient versus time, standard therapies or genomically targeted therapies usually have the uh, benefit for median survival. So as shown in the curve here, you see the delay um, of, the, uh, of, of the curve comparing to the control. However, cancer immunotherapy can indeed raise the tail of this survival curve. And in other words, you get a long-term uh, durable clinical response for this can uh, cancer patient, and uh, you have the subset of cured patients um, in this treatment. And the many researchers believe that by comparing, uh, com combine cancer immunotherapy with other immunotherapy, uh, other therapies, we can even, uh, even, even further improve the fraction of this cured population um, in the near future. In order to understand how cancer immunotherapy could be so e effective and powerful, I will first give you a very brief introduction uh, to, cancer uh, to cancer immunotherapy by discussing the definition, uh, the history, and the, um, the di different types of cancer immunotherapy and the current state. In the second part of my talk, I will show you two examples of the research project uh, we are doing in Dallas Urban's lab uh, to, to show how we can marry these two fields of material engineering and cancer immunotherapy to further improve uh, some of the uh, immunotherapies. You could have very different ways to define cancer immunotherapy, but I think the core of the idea is to harness the power of your own immune system to fight with cancer. And in, it's true that you are the own uh, secret weapon against the cancer. In general, there are two important ways to uh, generate uh, effective cancer immunotherapy. 
One is a so-called active cancer immunotherapy. In that way, you stimulate and boost the immune system to generate the immunity against the cancer. Another way is a more a passive uh, cancer immunotherapy that you uh, enhance the existing immune response by adding some uh, additional support to help your immune system to better fight with cancer. However, cancer immunotherapy is nothing new or something come out um, recently. It actually has been around for more than 100 years. As early as the uh, 1890s, uh, it uh, began notably with the uh, Dr. William Corley and his work using a bacterial vaccine. As a young uh, New York surgeon, he noticed some of his patients has a spontaneous remission uh, in sarcoma, and these patients are also infect, uh, with a bacterial infection. In attempt to uh, reproduce this clinical observation, he used a, bacteria, uh, a mixed bacterial vaccine, later called the Corley's toxin, to give an intratumoral injection into this sarcoma patient. And uh, um, in that way, um, some of the significant response has been observed. However, uh, given the very many lim limitations at that time and the uh, limited knowledge of immunology and cancer, um, although, although he tried these therapies in very large number of patients, almost a thousand patients, however, the success was rare and very difficult to reproduce. So after this first attempt um, in immunotherapy, um, it has been a long time, about like 50 or 60 years, the cancer immunotherapy has developed very slowly. Um, actually, during that time, a lot of skepticism and criticism have always go around with these new therapies, and immunotherapy never become a mainstream of the cancer treatment by the clinicians. However, our knowledge of uh, immunology and cancer did grow in that time. For example, the first tumor-specific antigen has been discovered in 1950s, I believe, and also the dendritic cell has been discovered uh, as antigen-presenting cells. So until 1970s, um, the first successful cancer immunotherapy called the BCG vaccine is also a mixed bacteria-based vaccine has been developed by Dr. Morton. And this vaccine, uh, this vaccine-based immunotherapy eventually got FDA appro approval for the treatment of bladder cancer. However, this specific therapy has been very limited only for the bladder cancers and never been widely applied for the many other types of cancer. Um, in 1980s, the first study using adoptive T cell therapy um, has been um, um, has been carried out by Dr. Rosenberg um, using a octagonal tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So, in some of the patients, you can see the uh, objective objective response um, of the uh, uh, progression uh, regression of the metastasis in these lung uh, tissues in the patient with metastatic melanoma. With uh, this very exciting result and many others during that time, in 1990s, finally, cancer the enthusiasm of cancer immunotherapy research since finally been resumed. Um, in 1992, um, interleukin-2 as a cytokine drug has been approved for the treatment of uh, different types of cancer. In the renal cell carcinoma, 7% of uh, uh, object response has been uh, documented. And in 1997, the first monoclonal antibody has been approved for the treatment of cancer. During that time, uh, many important uh, discoveries also has been uh, found, uh, uh, very uh, important uh, discoveries. For example, the um, discovery of the check, uh, immune checkpoint by Dr. James Allison, uh, Dr. Hunju and uh, Li Ping Chen and uh, uh, Freeman and Sharp. And also Dr. Schreiber um, developed a theory of uh, cancer immune editing the, use the three famous E's to describe the relation between the cancer and the immune system, um, elimination, equilibrium, and the escape. Um, until recently, the floodgate of cancer immunotherapy has finally opened, and you can see uh, so many FDA approved drugs recently, including the first the therapeutic cancer vaccine um, based on the uh, dendritic cells, and uh, uh, three antibodies has been approved as a checkpoint uh, blockade antibodies and achieve very long-term uh, benefit for the for the treated cancer uh, for the for the patients uh, either um, with melanoma or with the advanced lung cancer. Because of this uh, treatment, Science Magazine uh, highlight uh, cancer immunotherapy as the breakthrough of the year 2013. Right now, there are uh, almost 2,000 clinical trials of cancer immunotherapy are ongoing, and we. I'm sure we can foresee more and more success in clinic and also FDA-approved reagent. 
So next, I will uh, give you a very brief um, um, introduction of how the gen how the immune anti-tumor immunity uh, be generated and regulated in our body to against the cancer. In a greatly simplified scheme, I'm showing here the cancer cells can be uh, lysed by, for example, innate immunity, and this the released antigen from the cancer cells can be uptake and uh, processed by the antigen presenting cells. The APC um, can further present the fragment of the antigen and activate the naive T cells. However, during this process, if a positive signal is sent to the T cells, the T cells will be activated normally, and these activated tumor-specific T cells will multiply themselves and seek out the cancer cells and destroy the uh, tumor cells eventually. However, if a negative signal is sent to the T cells during the uh, antigen presentation, um, the function of the T cell will be shut down, and these T cells won't be activated and have the function to against cancer. So looking at each step of this uh, uh, generation of the immunity, we can target and promote any of these uh, steps to generate an effective cancer immunotherapy. For example, we can use a cancer therapeutic vaccine to promote the antigen presentation in this step. Or we can use a, a cytokine drug uh, to promote the T cell proliferation and expansion to generate more uh, tumor specific T cells against the cancer. Or we can use directly infuse a large number of tumor specific T cells directly into the patient to fight with the cancer. So this is one of the most potent cancer immunotherapy so far. Or we can use antibody to block these uh, uh, co-inhibitory receptors to, um, have, to have more T cells to gain the function against the cancer. Another uh, general um, therapy is using monoclonal antibodies can help this whole process in different mechanisms. <coughs> so next, I I'm going to talk each of them and um, um, show you the current state of them, of the, these therapies. So using the uh, vaccine-based therapy, um, uh, we first need to uh, develop this um, uh, vaccine. For, uh, vaccine is usually a substance that used to stimulate the immune system and generate the immune response, immune response against the disease, but result in inducing that disease. They are prepared from the uh, causative agent of a disease or its product or a synthetic subunit. So using a cancer vaccine, you can activate the antigen presenting cells, and this APC can further activate the naive T cells and uh, uh, generate activated tumor specific T cells. And these T cells will find and, uh, and fight with the abnormal tissues. Here is the tumor. There's a, so far, it's one FDA approved cancer vaccine is a, a Cepulizo T, which is antigen loaded dendritic cells. Uh, cytokine drug, um, for example, interleukin 2 or called L2, is known as a T cell fac uh, growth factors. Using this cytokine drug, you can expand uh, the T. Um, um, all the T cells non-specifically. And of course, among the, of them, there will be uh, tumor-specific T cells, and these T cells will uh, also gain more of the expansion benefit and, the, and the fight with the cancer cells. FDA approved example uh, inc include interleukin-2 and the interferon alpha. Adoptive T cell therapy is, uh, has uh, recently shown a particularly uh, striking result in uh, many of the clinical trials. There are, in general, two ways to generate these uh, tumor-specific T cells. One is to collect the autologous T cells from the tumor tissue. It's called the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And expand these uh, TIL uh, lymphocytes ex vivo, and then infuse back into the patient to fight with cancer. Or you can collect these uh, T cells from the periphery blood lymphocytes, and gen genomically, uh, genetically modify these T cells to make it cancer-specific. You can introduce uh, uh, tumor-specific uh, T cell receptors called the TCR, or you can um, transfect it with uh, uh, chimeric antigen receptors called CAR T cells. And there are currently no FDA-approved agents in this therapy, but many of them has been in uh, active, very active clinical uh, evaluations for melanoma and the lung cancer and the, uh, leukemias. Another important category of cancer immunotherapy is uh, checkpoint inhibitors. <coughs> um, Checkpoint is a function as a break of your immune system. So during this antigen presenting process, the checkpoint uh, receptors, for example, CTLA4 and the PD-1, if they are bind with a ligand, a negative signal will send, uh, inhibitory signal will send to the T cell, and T cell won't be activated correctly, and they won't have the function to fight, and we, uh, uh, fight with the cancer. If we develop an antibody, which can block these receptors, for example, use anti-CTL4, 
or anti-PD-1, then this receptor won't be able to bind with the ligand from the APC or the tumor cells. And these T cells will be uh, activated correctly and they will um, function normally as your anti-tumor immunity, part of your, your anti-tumor immunities. Um, so far, FDA, FDA has approved anti-CDL4 and anti-PD-1, uh, for example, for these um, um, specific therapies. And these therapies show a particular, particularly uh, long-term durable response for the patient with the treatment. Another example is the monoclonal antibodies. And uh, um, in general, these antibodies can function in many different mechanisms to fight with cancer. One of the most important ones is uh, called antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, ADCC. So in this mechanism, the antibodies can, uh, a tumor-specific antibody can bind with the tumor cells and provide a target for FC receptors. And uh, um, the natural killer cells with the FC receptor can um, can recognize this uh, uh, FC portion of the antibody, and uh, through the cross-linking of the receptors, the NK cells will be activated and uh, secrete the granzyme B or porphyrin to lysis the tumor cells. And in the meantime, the debris of the cancer cells will further um, uh, be presented by the APC and uh, um, uh, stimulate the adaptive immunity as well. Other mechanisms, including uh, using an anti antibody to block the growth factor receptor demonization on the tumor cells. So when you block these signals, the proliferation signal won't be sent to the cancer cells. And in that way, you can uh, block the, uh, the tumor proliferation. Other mechanisms, uh, for example, the immune modulation, for example, the uh, checkpoint um, blockade is part of that. And also, you can use a co-stimulatory agonist antibody to further stimulate the uh, tumor-specific T cells. And uh, antibodies can also be used as a delivery vehicle to directly introduce the cytotoxic toxic agents into the uh, cancer patient, uh, the, the tumor tissues. Um, there's more than a dozen antibody has been already approved for the treatment of cancer. Uh, examples including uh, anti-HER2, anti-CD20, uh, or anti-VEGF. Um, to summarize this part, so so from these examples, you can see that uh, effective cancer immunotherapy has these features. It's usually very specific for the cancer tissue, uh, for only in the disease tissues. And they, they can be systemic, uh, have the capability to traffic and find the cancer cells and kill them. Um, and uh, also can generate adaptive uh, immunity um, to against the cancer. And usually it's a, a durable um, uh, treatment and you can have the immune memory to protect the cancer, uh, pr pr protect the cancer patient for long term. And intrinsically is a universal treatment for different types of cancer. And comparing to the standard therapies, this therapy could be uh, associated with a reduced side effect. Um, so next, I'm going to show you um, that um, how we can marry these very two different fields. One is a material science engineering, and the other is a cancer immunotherapy to use some engineering approach to further improve the cancer immunotherapy, and by introducing you an emerging field of uh, immunoengineering. Um, in, actually, in this field, many of the researchers have already done excellent work to improve almost all kinds of cancer immunotherapy in different ways. For example, here, by introducing a lipid tail to the antigen or adjuvant, to facilitate the binding with the endogenous albumin. In that way, we can uh, largely improve the trafficking of this vaccine into the lymph node, and therefore uh, substantially improve the immune response of this vaccine against the cancer or other disease. And here, by chemically conjugate epitope to a short peptide, and this peptide will self-assemble at a certain condition and generate a multivalent vaccine, and using that way to also uh, largely improve the vaccine response um, of this uh, specific epitope. Instead of introducing uh, materials to your immune system, researchers also develop new materials. For example, here is a biocompatible implant to actively recruit the immune cells into this artificial microenvironment. And using the uh, uh, antigens embedded uh, inside the materials to use the, uh, and help the immune cells to present the uh, specific antigens to generate the immunity against cancer or other disease. And also materials can be used to develop a delivery vehicles, for example, nanoparticle here, to achieve a co-delivery uh, of interleukin-2 or TGF-beta inhibitors together to overcome the immunosuppression in the cancer, um, in, in the um, tumor microenvironment to generate a more potent T-cell response against the cancer cells. 
So here in, uh, oh, what happened? Sorry. Um, in this example um, in, of the project in Urban Lab, we uh, attempt to enhance adoptive T cell therapy because this therapy has shown a lot of promise in uh, different types of cancer, including uh, melanoma, lung cancers, and uh, uh, leukemias. <coughs> so recent, uh, in, in some of the recent clinical uh, trials, for example, this one, uh, very striking result, as high as 90% uh, uh, complete remission has been uh, documented in the treated patient. However, in the, in the treatment of using this adoptive therapy, adoptive T cell therapy for the solid tumor, fewer long-term survival has been observed. Uh, for example, here using the uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes together with interleukin-2 to treat the patient with metastatic melanoma, much lower uh, long-term survival has been observed comparing to the other uh, examples. And we, and the, uh, we think this is uh, most likely due to the highly immunosuppressive microenvironment of the solid tumor. It is, has been known that regulatory T cells, tumor associated macrophage, uh, myroid derived suppressor cells, and also as well as other soluble factors, can work together and, uh, subst uh, and generate substantial immunosuppression of the T cell uh, functionalities against the cancers. In order to o overcome these uh, highly uh, tumor suppressions, typically, uh, adjuvant drugs, including uh, cytokines, interleukin-2, or um, co-stimulatory agonist antibodies need to be used together with the adoptive T cell to help this T cell uh, promote, uh, promote their function against the cancer. However, when you're using this reagent, they are also associated with um, serious toxicities. So we are thinking at that time, can we focus this adjuvant drug only onto these adoptive T cells and uh, without systemic exposure. So in that way, we can still promote these uh, tumor-specific T cells, but without causing toxicities in the patient. So the idea is to develop a nanoparticle delivery system to load with T, uh, T cell promoting drugs, for example, interleukin-2. Then we link these particles onto the surface of the adopt transfer T cells and then infuse these T cells with the nanoparticle backpack on the surface back into the patient or the animals. The drug, the T cell promoting drug from the nanoparticle will keep releasing, uh, keep release from the, uh, the particles and the only function on the surface of these T cells to facilitate their expansion and the proliferation. And in that way, we expected to see a specific expansion of only these uh, uh, adopt transfer T cells without causing any other toxicities or non-specific expansion. <coughs> then we developed this uh, lipid-based um, liposome system to um, effectively load the um, cytokine drug. And we modify the surface with the uh, chemical group melanoma to facilitate the chemical conjugation with the freestyle group on these T cells. Now here we're showing that we, using that way, we can uh, very sufficiently load the nanoparticles onto the T cell surface. And these particles can stay stably and anchored on the surface without internalization for at least a few days on these T cells. By controlling the number of the nanoparticles on the T cells, we can maintain the killing function of the, these T cells in vitro, um, in these co-incubation uh, uh, assays. And how the drug can get released? Uh, we know that the activated T cells, when they see the target cells, they can secrete uh, granzyme B and the uh, porphyrin to lysate the target cells. Because the particle is also designed with a similar bilayer lipid structure as the cell membranes, the secreted uh, granzyme and the porphyrin will also lysate the liposome particles and release the drug from the particle. And in the meantime, these particles, uh, these drugs will uh, stimulate uh, the T cell proliferation. And here just showing some evidence that the porphyrin can generate a whole structure in the bilayer membrane. To test that, uh, we use a fluorescence labeled OVA as a model drug to load it into the particles. 
by co-incubate the T cells with the stimulation Bs, and we did see the reduce of the fluorescence from the uh, particles, indicating the release of the model drug from the particle when the T cells see the uh, target antigen. So in here, uh, I'm showing you that with the nanoparticle backpack, as shown in yellow, these T cells showing uh, blue can still maintain their function to seek out the tumor cells in vitro and eventually destroy uh, these tumor cells showing the uh, green color. <clears throat> Does now particle affect their tumor homing, homing uh, properties of the T cells? We test that in a spontaneous prostate cancer. And this cancer is known, can generate a lot of uh, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We label the T cells with the uh, uh, luciferase, then we can check in these T cells in vivo using bioluminescence imaging. By comparing the T cell alone or the T cells with uh, surface bound nanoparticles, they show uh, almost similar uh, uh, signals of, of, resin, uh, of luminescence uh, in the uh, tumor bearing mice. And interestingly, when we look at the fluorescence generated by the nanoparticles, um, by comparing either the the free nanoparticles or nanoparticles bound onto the T cells, we see that much more nanoparticle has been targeted into the prostate cancer uh, using this T cell as a carrier. So indicate that the T cells and the particles are indeed can be um, home to the tumor tissues very effectively. The next we want to test if we can in really using this strategy to expand the tumor specific T cells. And this, we test this in a lung metastasis model uh, of melanoma. These mice received the systemic injected melanoma cells, B16F10. They generated lung metastasis. Um, then we gave the tumor specific T cells from harvest from PIMO1 mouse, uh, which expressed the GP100, um, uh, target the uh, GP100 um, specific antigens of this uh, melanoma. When you're given the T cells alone, the T cells can, cannot expand substantially in these tumor bearing mice. Then we support these T cells with a soluble cytokine. L15 and L21, these two are known, can work together to eff effectively expand T cells. However, you didn't see much uh, improvement in the expansion. But if we give these T cells with the surface linked nanoparticle, which containing the uh, same equivalent amount of drug as, as in this group, these T cells has uh, been remarkably improved for the expansion in these tumor bearing mice. And you can see the T cells can be um, maintained for much longer time in the uh, mouse body. And uh, by uh, evaluating the survival of these mice, and indeed we, uh, we can generate a, a much uh, longer survival for the treated mice with the, with the T cells and carrying, carrying the nanoparticle backpack. So to summarize this part of project, um, we create these uh, nanoparticles and uh, chemically anchor them onto the T cell surface to achieve autocrine uh, stimulation of these tumor specific T cells. And in that way, we can specifically expand the T cells and generate uh, um, improved efficacy against the melanoma cancer. If you think about this platform, we can easily generate other applications using the same uh, strategy. For example, if you load the particles with the imaging ligand, you can easily trace and uh, checking the adoptive uh, donor cells. Or you can load the particles with uh, chemo therapies, for example. Then you can probably get some synergy between synergy between the T cells and the chemotherapy. And we actually published a paper described that uh, strategy um, recently. <clears throat> However, you may notice one limitation in these uh, engineering strategies. Because the nanoparticle was um, loaded onto the T cells during their ex vivo expansion. And uh, you can only load a limited amount of drug. And the drug will be released over time when the T cells uh, circulate in the patient. And the T cells will also uh, proliferate and uh, uh, multiple, and you get further diluted amount of the drug. So this is uh, the one-time nature of this drug, this, uh, this strategy. Can we develop another um, better way to achieve a reload of these T cells with the T cell promoting drug to even get a better control of the dosing to help the T cell to generate even enough uh, activities? So the idea is to uh, achieve an in vivo arming of this uh, double transfer T cell. After T cells injected into the uh, patient or the animal models, they will circulate in the blood. Will, some of them will uh, circulate in the blood, and some of them will um, accumulate in the tumor tissues. 
um, in order to target these T cells uh, in the blood vessels, can we generate a targeting liposome system? Load with the cytokine drug, which can promote this, these T cells. If these nanoparticles can bind with the adoption for T cells onto the surface, similarly as the backpack, and the, the drug will be released from the particle and further um, expand these tumor-specific T cells. So in that way, we can uh, treat, um, control the amount of dosing. And the repeated giving the nanoparticles will be much easier than repeated adoptive T cell therapies uh, in the clinical practice. So we are thinking about the targeting strategy using two different ligands. So one of the ligands we are using is uh, interleukin-2, or L2. It is known that the activated T cells has expressed much higher level of the L2 receptors. So by modifying this liposome system with the L2 on the surface, the L2 will bind with L2 receptor on the uh, dot transfer T cells. And in the meantime, the L2 will also stimulate the T cell expansion. So the L2 is function as a, has a dual function in, in this targeting systems. Or we can target um, innocuous markers, for example, the Cy1, because the activated T cells we use is from the uh, transgenic mice has an isotype of the Cy1, it's called Cy1.1. So we can use this antibody to target uh, this Cy1.1. Um, in that way, we will likely have less of uh, off, -targeting, off targeting issues, but also you need to load the liposome with another T cell promoting drug. Then we test both nano particles in vitro first. We compare in two populations of T cells. One is the naive CDA T cells from the host. <clears throat> One is the activated CDA T cells we will use for the adoptive transfer. We can easily differentiate the two populations from the Cy1.1 marker in, the, uh, in this facts analysis. And as expected, this activated T cell has much higher level of L2 receptor. Then we mix the two cells uh, in a text tube in vitro and adding the nanoparticles incubate for a certain time. Then we um, analyze their binding. The nanoparticles are labeled with a fluorescence dye. Then we can easily, by looking at the um, fluorescence intensity, to look at the targeting effect. Using both nanoparticles, either the L2 modified liposome or the antibody mod modified liposome, we see the um, substantially uh, targeting effect for the only the activated T cells. And the naive T cells remain uh, almost um, non-binding with the fluorescence particle. In the competition assay, we add in the soluble ligands, L2 or the antibodies, and the targeting effect has been substantially reduced. This indicates the targeting is in, uh, indeed from the specific binding between the receptor and the ligands, as we expected. Uh, here is just showing the uh, quantitative data. Uh, then we further test this targeting effect in vivo. We use two procedures. In both of them, the T cells was uh, double transferred one day after lymphodepletion. In procedure A, the nanoparticle was injected right after the T cells on the same day. In procedure B, it's a more stringent condition to test the targeting. The particle was given three days after adopt transfer. So in that way, we want to really test if we can achieve a repeated expansion of these transferred T cells. And then we evaluate by fluorocytometry. In the procedure A, um, the day zero procedure of the nanoparticles. Both L2 liposomes or the antibody liposomes has shown a, a very strong targeting effect for the double transfer T cells in blood. But when we look at the procedure B, um, the antibody modified liposomes still have the same level of the targeting. However, the L2 modified liposome has less targeting effect. And we think this mostly due to the T cells has been uh, circulated for three days without any support from the cytokine. They may downregulate the L2 receptors. So the targeting effect from the L2 modified liposome is not as good as um, the anti antibody modified liposome. However, the L2 um, modified liposome is still very easy to formulate. And uh, the L2 has a dual function. We still first test the L2 liposomes for their in vivo expansion. So in these experiments, we again label the T cells with luciferase. Then we can image these T cells in vivo using bioluminescence uh, imaging system. By comparing the T cell owning or the T cells um, together with the targeting nanoparticle on the same day, we see after two days, the T cells has been expanded uh, much more in this group comparing to the T cells, T cells alone group. However, on day six, you can see the number of T cells has been uh, going down and reduced um, because the uh, after the uh, L2 drug in the nanoparticle has been consumed. At that time, if we give the second dose 
of the tucking nanoparticle on day six, and we can see the T cell expansion can be resumed, and you have even higher number of these tumor specific T cells. So, so here, the results show that we can indeed achieve a repeated expansion of the transferred T cells using this tucking nanoparticle. And we further uh, analyzed the T cell population using cytometry. By comparing with the T cell alone group or the T cell with a systemic free L2, using the nanoparticles, we can indeed generate significantly higher of the frequency of the uh, transferred T cells among all the CDA T cells. And then we test if we can indeed using this strategy to enhance the therapeutic efficacy. And we give three dose of these nanoparticle, tucking nanoparticles after T cell uh, adoptive transfer. And we see that um, this treatment can indeed slow down the tumor growth and uh, generate the benefit of the survival for, the, um, for this mouse model bearing the, um, the melanoma, of a subcutaneous uh, melanoma model. Uh, to summarize this part of work, um, we developed this targeting nanoparticle, either use uh, L2 or use anti cell uh, one to modify the surface to target the adult transfer T cells. And using these particles, we can achieve repeated expansion, specific expansion of the adult transfer T cells and improve these efficacies against the uh, melanoma model in mice. Uh, with that, I would like to um, thank uh, my Postdoc mentor Professor Daryl Irvin and uh, Iran, uh, a grad student, and Leon, a technician who has been working with me very closely in my postdoc work. Um, and also our collaborators, Marcella Moss from uh, Mass Journal, and Dr. Hing Wang and Emily from Alto Bioscience, and Dr. Um, uh, Dame Richard as a neighbor at MIT, um, and also the funding. Um, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, um, there's always these things that come to mind, which are, you know, you create all these, uh, like, first of all, checkpoint antibodies are really quite effective in clinic now. They're very easy to deliver to patients. The patient shows up 30 minute infusion, you're out the door. Mm. And the response rates are really high. Um, uh, this looks like a viable uh, pathway to even go beyond. But the, 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 um, what is the clearance issues either in terms of neutralizing antibodies? When you start adding things to T cells or the liver or the kidneys, and do you, do you really see that the tumors disappear, or do you just get some transient shrinkage and then it looks like the tumors start growing after a while anyway? Using the checkpoint antibody? Checkpoint. No, no, using this later oh, the, the T -cells technology. Now. I'm just trying to figure out whether it's, it's harnessable. Oh, I mean, for example, Cipricel, the, the, the prostate cancer treatment was FDA approved, but really never got off, it hasn't really gotten off the ground very well. But I'm wondering, um, this might be a tough question, maybe it's too soon, is this early development? Uh, uh, let's just stick with the clearance issues, um, renal or liver. I didn't see too much hot spots in the liver or the kidneys, but what, when you start adding things to T cells, do they get cleared uh, faster or not? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So, of course, these are in very early uh, development, uh, mostly uh, preclinical studies. Um, in general, we want to just uh, generate um, uh, uh, engineering strategy to boost the T cell therapies uh, using more safer and effective ways. Um, in regarding the clearance of the reagent that we are adding, for example, the nanoparticles, uh, they are not quite similar as the conventional nanoparticles, which giving a systemic because these T cells, uh, these particles, they are bind with the double transfer T cells. So they are all the biodistribution clearance is more governed by the T cells, and we know that the, the T cells itself can circulate for much longer time. And they don't have the clearance issues. So the nanoparticles are supposed to be have a better uh, half life or their uh, tissue accum uh, tumor tissue accumulations. Yeah. Have you measured directly whether um, adding nanoparticles and <coughs> particularly at high density on the T cells changes the clearance? Of the particle yeah. or the, yeah. uh, we haven't done that. Okay. All right. yeah. Yeah. Yes? You know, I, I can add to Omar's comment, at least uh, what is shown in uh, renal 
perspective is uh, liposomes tend to block the proximal tubules and some of these patients do present with renal toxicity, uh, acute kidney injury. So that would be at least a uh, concern clinically um, uh, of these nanoparticles and especially with liposome because it's liquid and proximal tubular cells uh, would uh, you know, uh, take it up uh, very energetically. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's so do you have the proportion of free versus bound particle or maybe I'm missing your presentation? The, the uh, so when you inject a nanoparticles mm. in animals, do you have an idea about free versus bound nanoparticles in blood? Uh, we don't have that data yet. Yeah. John? In your uh, targeted uh, liposomes, you targeted IL-2, which is present in many cells. I mean, I, I was expecting you to say that you put a specific target on the adoptive Yes, yes, uh, that's a very good idea. So um, actually that could be the, uh, the directions if we want to move in this project forward. So IL-2 is kind of used as a proof of concept and we know it's not um, uh, specific only for the, uh, for the transfer of the T cells. There could be T-Rex cells or many other uh, issues. So that's why I mentioned that we can also modify this liposome with a anti side one for this model because these transgenic mouse, they have a isotype of uh, side one And in, uh, we expected in, um, in clinical, you probably want to generate another uh, noculus markers for these targeting strategies. Yeah. Uh, no, we didn't. Yeah, because this, um, these liposomes only carry the L2. Um, so, and uh, the mouse received the lymphoid depression before they, they received the adopt T cell transfers. So, I will expect it that the L2 uh, containing liposome will have very minimum effect on the uh, therapeutic. Um, uh, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, actually, we are not attempt to uh, alter the trafficking of T cells using nanoparticles. Um, um, we we, we target, targeting not the high affinity um, L2 receptor, just the CD25 of these um, yeah, effector T cells. Um, the T cell trafficking. We hope we don't change their trafficking with loading particles on the surface. Um, but the, the trafficking issues of T-cell itself we, um, is not something we can address by this uh, targeting our particle. Yeah. Um, I had a question. You showed early on that um, you know, when you attach ex vivo the nanoparticles mm -hmm. to the adopted T-cells that, yeah. you know, uh, and then put them uh, in, you, the, the, the nanoparticles maintain for a couple of days, but then but then the, the, the density of them drops off pretty significantly. Do you know what the mechanism of that is? Um, actually, I didn't show the data of the job, but they can at least maintain for the, uh, the in the data show four days, they are not internalized. So okay. that's very important for us because we want to maintain the particle on the surface. So the L2 will release only around the T cell surface to bind with the receptors. And actually, indeed, they will be dropped as is expected because the the drug will release from the particle. So that drug release as opposed to it. Yes, and also T cell will doubling and the multiple and the 
in that way is also diluted the amount sure. of the particles. Yeah. I run last question and then we're going to move on. I probably missed this. Uh, the animal model, is that localized or is that metastatic? Is that a model? Uh, we, we did both. Um, I, today I show you the data of the metastatic lama, lama tesis model of the melanoma. Yeah. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tang for uh, opening the <laughs> It's also now my pleasure to introduce uh, Stefan Anderson. He is part of the uh, uh, training core and other components of the uh, CFTCC, and he and I will be switching off duties as uh, MCs today. No, I don't need this. I'm just introducing the next speaker. Thank you, Bennett. Um, I am uh, a part of the training corps, as Bennett said, and also am a radiologist here at the uh, university. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next uh, speaker, Dr. Zhu. Dr. Zhu is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, as part of the Edwin L. Steele Laboratory in Tumor Biology, the Zhu Laboratory is interested in tumor host interactions, especially with respect to uh, angiogenesis and the development of tumor metastases. And beyond, the, uh, beyond her laboratory's interest in tumor host interactions, she's very interested in developing new um, therapeutic targets for novel drugs. And she'll be discussing the normalization of the tumor microenvironment and um, doing so in order to improve drug uh, delivery and efficacy. With that, Dr. Zhu. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks to the organizer for uh, inviting me. Um, so I'm going to need all four files. Mm -hmm. Getting them right now. Yeah. All in the same folder. I know how it does. Yeah. Okay, so today I'll be talking about targeting the tumor microenvironment to overcome resistance. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Uh, so I'll be giving an um, introduction at the beginning for the physiological resistance. How does the abnormal tumor uh, vasculature and the abnormal tumor extracellular matrix lead to insufficient uh, drug delivery? And I'll be presenting uh, some data on the strategies that we use to increase drug delivery by normalizing the tumor vasculature and normalizing the uh, extracellular matrix. So many studies have been done uh, on the uh, intrinsic cellular resistance mechanism, including dysregulated DNA repair, increased drug efflux, and decreased cell apoptosis. So our study focused on the physiological resistance. How does the abnormal tumor vasculature and the abnormal tumor microvacuum um, the uh, extracellular matrix leads to insufficient drug delivery. Um, a brief introduction on the tumor microenvironment. So the tumor microenvironment consists of blood vessels and lymphatic vessels uh, together with uh, um, 
cancer cells and a, and a lot variety of uh, non-malignant host cells. So host cells include fibroblasts and the uh, resident and trafficking immune cells. So the effective delivery of therapeutics uh, to the tumor site is a pre primary requirement for effective treatment. So to reach cancer cells, the uh, bloodborne uh, therapeutics must be carried by blood flow to the tumor site, and then it must cross the uh, vessel walls and then diffuse through the extracellular matrix to reach the cancer cell. I don't know if you can see these vessels. Uh, so can you see the vessels? Not really. Okay. So the tumor vasculature demonstrates a number of structural and functional abnormalities compared to normal vessels. Yes, that will help, thank you. So this is a 3D uh, image of uh, um, normal blood vessels. You can see it's smooth, it's organized, and it's uh, um, in this very ordered uh, uh, network. So unlike the normal vessels, the tumor vessel is uh, torturous, it's enlarged, and then it's chaotic in organization. So the structure of the vessel wall is also uh, very, um, abnormal. So with large gaps between the endocellular cells, and then it lacks parasite coverage. It also has abnormally thick or thin basement membrane. Um, so because of all of these structural abnormalities, the perfusion of tumor vasculature is also abnormal, both spatially and temporally. So you can see areas with a lot of perfusion and area has almost no perfusion. And also there's vessels sometimes have perfusion and then later times has no perfusion. So this heterogeneity in perfusion leads to hypoxia and low acidic pH, low uh, extracellular pH. Um, so this data shows that from the edge, the periphery of the tumor, to the center of the tumor, uh, both oxygen and uh, pH drop significantly. So this um, the heterogeneity in the perfusion also limits the um, uh, bloodborne therapeutics and the immune effector cells to reach the tumor site and leads to resistance. It has been very well characterized that the hypoxia and the low acidic, low tumor pH fuels malignant progression of the cancer uh, by inducing inst genomic instability, angiogenesis, immune suppression, the stemness, metastasis, and resistance to apoptosis. So they also confer resistance because varieties of treatment like radiation or certain chemotherapy drugs require oxygen to be effective. Um, so based on all of this study, um, the strategy that we propose to use to increase drug delivery is to normalize the vasculature and then to normalize the extracellular matrix. So there are various preclinical and clinical studies in um, a number of uh, cancers that has been shown. When anti-VEGF therapy is added to, uh, given to the patients, uh, it normalizes the tumor vasculature. So what it, it does is that it trims away the abnormal tumor vessels and then leaves the remaining vessels both structurally and functionally closer to normal. And then because of this uh, uh, vessel normalization, there's improved delivery of oxygen. Uh, there's improved drug delivery. So when anti-VEGF therapy is used as an adjunct to chemoradiation therapy, it enhances patient survival. So I'm not gonna talk about the uh, um, normalization, the vessel normalization effect. So I'll be focusing on the um, matrix normalization um, strategy. Um, so we decided to target the angiotensin TGF beta signaling pathway to reduce the amount of collagen fibers within the tumor. So what it does is that by decreasing collagen, the tumor mass is less dense, and then there's less compression on the tumor vessels, and there's a better chance for the tumor vessel to open up and then for the blood to perfuse through. So the strategy, the method that we use, we uh, blocked TGF beta signaling pathway directly by genetic manipulation. We also used uh, uh, neutralizing TGF beta antibody. Um, so both of these are experimental uh, agents, and then we use a FDA approved uh, angiotensin II receptor one blocker, Losartan. So Losartan is used in the clinic to control patient uh, blood pressure, but it's also known that uh, Losartan reduces collagen level by inhibiting the activation of TGF-beta signaling. So we started the um, 
anti-fibrotic uh, strategies in human breast cancer and in human ovarian cancer. So in the genetic tumor model, TGF-beta signaling was shut down by this uh, soluble TGF-beta receptor so that we clone the extracellular domain of the TGF-beta receptor, fuse it to the FC portion of human IgG, and then we added a secretion signal in front of it. So the transfected cells constitutively express, secrete tons of soluble TGF-beta receptor that competes with the TGF-beta for the binding to the receptor 2 on the cell membrane. So this molecule uh, effectively blocked TGF-beta-1 and TGF-beta-3 induced SMAT2 phosphorylation, and it blocks cell proliferation. Uh, we implanted the parental and the transfected cell in, osteotopically into the memory fat pad of newton mice. Uh, and then we look at how does TGF-beta blockade affects the uh, uh, tumor vessels. So the tumor vasculature lacks parasite. So the parasite is very important in supporting the endothelial surface of the vessel wall. Uh, it plays a key role in the vessel maturation and vessel function. Without the parasite, the vessel is leaking. And then the leaking is disrupts perfusion, and that poses a challenge to drug delivery. So we collect the tumors, uh, and then we uh, stain the uh, uh, endothelial cells with, for CD31, and this shows up, shows up in green. And then we stain for a parasite, uh, NG2, it's a parasite marker, and that's in red. And the overlapping yellow signals tells you uh, the parasite-covered vessels. And then image analysis showed that with TGF-beta blockade, the percentage of, of vessels that are covered by parasites significantly increased, suggesting the um, uh, vessel structure is normalized. And then we look at the matrix. So this is, um, um, we stain for collagen 1, showing up in red. So there's tons of collagen 1 in the control tumors. And then with TGF-beta blockade, there's significant decrease in the collagen content. So we, that next we study whether this uh, um, change in the vessel and in the extracellular matrix leads to a change in the vessel perfusion function. So to, do the, to study the vessel perfusion, we injected fitzelectin into the tail vein of the mice. And then we waited for 15 minutes for the fitzelectin to circulate uh, throughout the body. And then we take out the tumors. We stained for the total amount of vessels with CD31 that shows up in red. And the green indicates perfused vessels. Um, so the image analysis showed that TGF-beta blockade significantly increased vessel perfusion. And then we studied how does that affect drug delivery. So we, this time we injected a red fluorescent uh, chemotherapeutic agent, doxorubicin, directly into the tail vein. And then after 15 minutes, we also collected the tumors. So we sectioned the tumors, and then we looked um, the red fluorescent signal directly under, under confocal microscope. So we quantified the total amount of red fluorescence within the tumor mass. And then we quantify the distance of the red signals that penetrated away from the vessel. Um, so with TGF-beta blockade, there's significantly more drug that's, that's delivered, accumulated within the tumor. And then they also penetrated further away, deeper into the tumor mass. Uh, and then next we look at the uh, efficacy. So in two tumor models, so the uh, breast cancer models, 41 and MDMB231, uh, uh, in the genetic and also with neutralizing TGF-beta antibody, so we observed that when DOXO, the chemotherapeutic agent, when it's given in combination with TGF-beta blockade, it's significantly more effective compared to chemotherapy by itself. So summary of this part of the study in the breast cancer model, that we showed TGF-beta blockade normalizes tumor vasculature. It decreases fibrosis, and as a result, it improves vessel perfusion, increases drug delivery, and enhances the efficacy of chemotherapy. Uh, so next we studied in the ovarian cancer model. So the ovarian cancer, uh, so following the initial surgery, the majority of ovarian cancer patients will receive chemotherapy. And despite the uh, initial responsiveness, the uh, majority of the uh, patients with advanced ovarian cancer will develop relapse with resistant disease. So this is a second harmonic generation image showing the collagen fibers within the tumors. You can see the tumor ha uh, has tons of collagens. And this will pose a solid stress that compressed the vessel and then um, stopped perfusion. So with collagen treatment, the collagen fiber decreased significantly. 
And this image is an overlap of the collagen um, uh, image with the perfusion image. So the blue is the collagen and the green shows perfused vessels. And you can see within the tumor, in the area where there, it's high in collagen content, there's very little perfused vessels. And then with, collagen, with losartan treatment, collagen uh, level decreased, and there's significantly more perfused vessels. So that's the strategy that we're going to pursue to increase drug delivery. So histology data confirms that with losartan treatment, there's significantly less collagen. So this is um, serous red uh, with collagen fibers showing up in red. And then there's enhanced perfusion. So these are the quantification of the images. So losartan treatment decreases fibrosis and increases perfusion in the ovarian cancer model. <clears throat> As a result of the improved perfusion, we observed that losartan decreased um, hypoxia, tumor hypoxia. So the brown area is, shows the um, positive staining for the pimonidazone indicates hypoxic region. And then it also enhanced drug delivery within the tumor. So those are the uh, quantification of the images, decreasing hypoxia and increased drug delivery. And also in two different human ovarian cancer models, we show that when Texo, that's a chemotherapy uh, drug used in ca uh, ovarian cancer patients, when Texo is given in combination with Losartan, it's significantly more effective compared to Texo alone. So another observation that we, uh, the major significant observation that we have is in the ovarian cancer model is that losartan significantly decreased ascites. It decreased the incidence of ascites, the number of mice that develop ascites. And in those mice that develop ascites, the amount of ascites is also significantly lower compared to the normal uh, parental mice. So two factors contribute to the formation of ascites, the increased production and then the decreased drainage. So it's known that tumor cells uh, express tons of VGF. So VGF is also called vascular permeability factor. So it leads to hyperpermeability of the vessels. It leads to the uh, production of, uh, um, increased production of ascites. So we have data that I'm now showing here that losartan does not change the VGF production in the tumors. So therefore, the ascites production remains the same between the control versus the treated group. So the only difference is the drainage. So this is a little uh, introduction on the drainage of the peritoneal fluid. Uh, so the drainage of ascites is um, um, mediated by the lymphatic vessels in the diaphragm. And this is a schematic of the lymphatic, uh, the diaphragm with the lymphatic vessels. So on the pleural side, the lymphatic vessels has larger lumens, and they're in this uh, structured uh, connection. Uh, on the peritoneal side, the lymphatic vessels uh, shows up in this parallel lymphatic strips. So um, the fluid in the peritoneal side is absorbed by the lymphatic vessels on the peritoneal side, and then drains through the diaphragm uh, to the pleural side, and then it goes on to, the, to be drained into the, uh, the veins. So in our experiment, we took out the diaphragms. So this is the diaphragm from normal non-tumor bearing mice. You can see there's sparse collagens, red, over here. And then in mice that has been implanted with the tumor, you can see some of the tumor grow attached to the diaphragm and then infiltrated into the diaphragm. And then the tumor cells produce lots of uh, collagen. So, and also the cancer cells activate, the cancer microenvironment activates the tumor-associated fibroblasts, the tumor-associated microphages. So both of them are major contributors to collagen production. So as a result, the, uh, the diaphragm from the tumor bearing mice express tons of collagen. And then the certain treatment significantly decreases collagen. So in this mice, there's similar um, uh, tumors in the diaphragm, and then you can see the, um, there's significantly less collagen in the diaphragm. So the question is, uh, that we're asking is, how does this change in fibrosis affect lymphatic vessels? Does that affect uh, the number of lymphatic vessels, or does that in fact affect the uh, drainage function of these lymphatic vessels? So first we look at the number. So that we uh, stain the lymphatic vessels with life one. So this is what the normal lymphatic vessels look like in the normal mice on the pleural side and also on the uh, peritoneal side. In mice bearing tumors, on the pleural side, the lymphatic vessel is significantly enlarged, suggesting that it's blocked somewhere. 
And then on the peritoneal side, it lost completely the um, organization, the structure, uh, as compared to the normal um, diaphragm. And the certain treatment, it normalizes the lymphatic vessels. On the pleural side, the uh, diameter is significantly smaller compared to the uh, non-treated mice, and then it also restored this, this uh, organized um, network on the peritoneal side. So this next image sh shows um, um, the morphology of the uh, um, lymphatic vessels in the diaphragm. So this, to do this experiment, we injected fixed dextran, dextran into the peritoneal cavity, and then we waited for 15 minutes for the, uh, the dextran to be absorbed into the lymphatic vessels. And then we take out the entire diaphragm and then just uh, observe it directly under the fluorescent microscope. Um, so it confirms the staining images data that the lymphatic vessel on the pleural side is significantly enlarged, indicating blockade. And then the, it lost the uh, um, organized network on the peritoneal side. And then the certain treatment restored the normal organization. We then quantified the diameter of lymphatic vessel on the pleural side. And then we see that the certain treatment by decreasing fibrosis, it, release, it relieves compression on the lymphatic vessels. And then, uh, um, so there's the, um, the lymphatic vessel is normalized. There's decreased uh, lymphatic vessel diameter. And then next we look at the uh, uh, drainage function. So this we injected a fluorescently labeled bead, one micron in diameter. And then we waited for two hours for the bees to be absorbed by the uh, lymphatic vessels and then to drain through the diaphragm and then to the lymph node. So first we collected the diaphragm. And you can see that after two hours, the majority of the uh, fluorescent bead has been drained through the diaphragm. There's very little uh, that uh, the fluorescent bead that still uh, remains in the diaphragm, but the majority has been drained to the lymph node. Wherever it's in the control mice, there's still tons of fluorescent bead that are still stuck in the diaphragm. And then a losartan treatment improves the drainage of the, the bead. So there's less um, that's stuck in the diaphragm. So this is the uh, claudal medial stanol lymph node that we collected. So those, that's the lymph node that the, uh, lymph the diaphragm lymphatic vessels drains to. So from non-tumor bearing mice, you can see in after two hours, a lot of the um, fluorescent, green fluorescent bead has reached the lymph node. Uh, and then in the tumor bearing mice, there's very little fluorescent bead. And then the certain treatment has increased the amount of drainage. So this is the quantification of the imaging, showing that the certain improves uh, diaphragm lymphatic vessel drainage. Um, so from this part of the study in human ovarian cancer, we concluded that normalizing the tumor marker environment improves vessel uh, perfusion, relieves tumor hypoxia, it increases drug delivery, uh, enhances the uh, chemotherapy efficacy. And uh, it also uh, normalizes the lymphatic vasculature and decreases ascites by um, uh, normalizing the function of the drainage function of lymphatic vessels. Uh, so this concluded my talk today. And uh, all of the studies are done in the steel lab, in our lab, in the steel lab. And then uh, the studies was founded by funds from NIH, from American Cancer Society, and from the DOD. Thank you.
possibility. Do the tumors grow faster, by the way, when you normalize the circulation? Do you have to get chemo in quickly or? So uh, so those are very uh, good points. So first of all, we have looked at other tumor models, especially the um, tumors that are known to be highly desmoplastic, like the uh, pancreatic tumor. Oh, yeah. So there's uh, less than 5% of cancer cells within the pancreatic tumor, and the majority are fibroblast, I mean the fibrosis. So we have also ongoing clinical trials um, at MGH that are uh, trying to look at how does losartan in combination with radiation therapy uh, can affect the uh, uh, patient survival and treatment efficacy. So the other point is that, um, um, so to look at uh, not only just the chemotherapy, we're also studying how does the um, normalization effect affect immune um, treatment. Because what we have observed is that is, um, there is less, um, infiltration of the immune cells, effector cells, in the tumor macro environment because of this uh, um, abnormal um, uh, vessel and the matrix. And also the abnormal tumor uh, um, macro environment, like the low oxygen hypoxia, they also confers to immune suppression. Um, Not yet. So we're uh, um, so we have studies that show that with uh, the anti-VEGF therapy, by normalizing the vasculature, we normalize the uh, microenvironment. So there's less hypoxia. So that converts the immunosuppressive microenvironment to a normal uh, immune status, and close to normal. Yeah. Interstitial pressures go down on the tumor and everything else. But interstitial pressures in the tumor reduce a lot. Yeah. Right. So interstitial fluid pressure decrease. So that enhanced the uh, delivery of both small molecule chemotherapeutic agents and also large, like nanoparticles, therapeutics. Hmm. So um, can a reduction of collagen serve as a double-edged sword? For example, um, you know, you reduce the collagen, tumors have now more ability to proliferate metastasize. And is that concern in the field that reduction of collagen can serve as a double-edged uh, sword? Um, and is it true that you know such targeted therapy should be at very specific stage of tumor formation rather than even you know, throughout the spectrum of tumorogenesis? Would you care to comment about that? Mm. So that's also a very good point. Uh, so there is, um, we look at the, uh, the uh, metastasis after anti-VEGF therapy and also the metastasis after um, uh, losartan. So with losartan, there's lots of retrospective studies because a lot of the uh, cancer patients, they were on the uh, losartan treatment to, for their blood uh, pressure control. And in those retrospective studies, we did not observe increased metastasis after losartan treatment, long time losartan treatment. But in, in your animal models, did you see, uh, are, are those models metastasis models? Uh, so the breast cancer is metastasis model, and then we did not see increased metastasis. And then the ovarian cancer, they don't want metastasis outside the peritoneal cavity. Gotcha. Hmm. Uh, what collagen, what isoform is uh, modulated by losartan? Is it one or four? One. One. Yeah. And cancer, uh, mostly. So collagen 1 is the major type of collagen in the tumor mice. So collagen 4 is the uh, collagen in the basement membrane of the vessels. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, your second point about the timing of this normalization effect, so that's also a very good uh, question. So what we found with the anti-VEGF therapy is that the normalization effect is transient. Um, so in the animal model, it's mostly between uh, day 2 and day 5. And then there's also lots of biomarker studies in the patients that shows the normalization effect uh, comes and then it goes. So um, what we found is that when the radiation or chemotherapeutic agent is applied during this normalization window, it's most effective. So we, we termed it normalization window. So that's a, during the time that it's the normalization effect is the, the most significant. So you don't want to be having people chronically on the drug. You want to pulse it. Is that the idea? Uh, so we don't know how this, um, how to instruct the, uh, um, so basically in the patients, the, the uh, antibiotic, the uh, anti-VEGF therapy right now is given. 
uh, continuously unless the patient cannot tolerate. And then in those patients, we found that uh, after a certain period of time, the vessels uh, grow back, the normal vessels grow back. Mm. So that indicates it, there's also a transient in the patient. Mm. So we do. So in the drug delivery study, we did uh, uh, doxorubicin. We also did doxo. So that's the size of a nanoparticle. And then we did see there's also improved delivery of a large size nanoparticles after both anti-vascular anti and uh, uh, normal uh, matrix normalization. That's exactly what we're trying to do right now. So we're trying to combine how to um, optimize and have VEGF therapy. So we're going to try giving them and then giving them uh, Losartan at the same time. Uh, and then in terms of control ascites with um, Losartan in ovarian cancer patients, I don't have an answer for that. So there's um, we need some uh, retrospective study on the um, Losartan usage in the ovarian cancer patients. That will give us some indication. Uh, whether there's decreased ascites formation in those patients. Yeah. But I don't have an answer for that. Oh. So one of your goals is to improve delivery of drugs, um, and you showed that the Losartan can improve the delivery of drugs. But what about delivery of the Losartan itself? Is there an issue with getting that into the tumor, especially into the core? Do you have to treat multiple times? Yeah, so Losartan is given every day. So basically, so in the animal models, so it's given like uh, seven days after tumor implantation, after the tumor form, until the time of sacrifice. But in the patients, um, they take Losartan continuously to um, control their blood pressure. Can you track the delivery or localization of the Losartan itself? We cannot. It's a small molecule. So we have never uh, quantified Losartan concentration in the tumor mass. But that's a good point. Yeah, so there's uh, um, studies in pancreatic tumor. There's also studies in the um, breast cancer patients that has retrospective data that show that patients um, with Losartan treatment, there's decreased fibrosis in their tumor mass. So those patients, uh, uh, yeah, most of those patients were on Losartan before they had, were detected with tumor. Yeah, in the patient that has. So, so the retrospective study is mostly just reporting the fibrosis. So there's definitely decreased fibrosis in those patients. Fluid pressure, yeah. Yeah, so in my breast cancer and ovarian cancer model, we didn't measure the interstitial fluid pressure, but it's known that a decreased interstitial fluid pressure would help the penetration of the drugs. But we didn't look at that um, in our model. Well, the drugs, yes, I'm curious mm -hmm. about the nanoparticles. Right, so we tested one of the um, agents that's similar in size with nanoparticles, so doxo, so that's a liposome embedded, uh, encapsulated doxorubicin. And then we found that that sized therapeutic agents, their delivery is also improved. I have a question as well from an imager's perspective. Are you doing any pre-treatment or post-treatment macroscale imaging of hypoxia or perfusion 
or even pressure. So we have some clinical tools available now that could maybe triage your patients before you give them therapy or after as mm. the efficacy. An MRI, for example. Yeah, so there's in the clinic, after anti-VEGF therapy, we did lots of uh, perfusion study like the K-trans. So those uh, patient samples show there's enhanced perfusion after normalization effect from the anti-VGF treatment. So, um, so if I understand correctly, the question is to if I can use ultrasound to detect perfusion in blood vessels. Yeah, so, I'm sorry? The stiffness, of the, the stiffness, yeah. Uh, so we have in our lab that we've developed this uh, uh, live uh, ultrasound Doppler imaging, it's called OFDI. So that can, um, uh, we can image vessels and uh, fibers with that uh, image. Uh, so we also try to use ultrasound to observe um, perfusion. So basically, we injected a bunch of uh, uh, bubbles, air bubbles, and we look at how the bubbles uh, distribute throughout the, the tumors. But then we found the resolution of ultrasound is not as good as the other type of imaging, like the uh, two-photon images. She's describing something else. She's interested in you can actually measure the mechanical properties, so how stiff, how compliant. In ultrasound, there's, there's work that's actually being done with shear wave imaging, Right. So right now we don't have. Uh, we in our lab we don't really have a model to study the, this. So what we are using is to use the amount of collagen as an indication of solid stress, the amount of solid stress present in the tumors. Right. Yeah, so, so right now we don't have that in the preclinical models. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. Elsie is currently the Executive Director of Exploratory Immuno-Oncology at NIBR, the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, and he's been instrumental in building their immuno-oncology uh, strategic area, including their collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania in developing these chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapies. He has more than 20 years of experience in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries, um, leading research and collaborative efforts in drug discovery and drug application filings, as well as licensing of products, uh, candidates, and, 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 and more. He was formerly vice president at Altus Pharmaceuticals, and um, prior to Altus, he was the senior director of program alliance management at Biogen. He holds a PhD in genetics from Cal Berkeley and completed postdoctoral research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gottmos. Just go ahead. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation um, uh, to speak at this uh, at this colloquium. It's been a really interesting morning, and uh, uh, looking forward to uh, to um, discussing what I think has become a very important uh, issue, as you heard from Dr. Tang this morning about uh, treating cancer by um, by uh, activating the immune system. Um, I guess I should disclose that I work for Novartis, if that wasn't clear before. Um, and uh, during, the, uh, during my talk, I will uh, tread some of the ground that uh, Dr. Tang went over, but I do think since it's immunology, we can all take a second, uh, second run at this. Uh, and also there are a number of areas that I want to emphasize. But before I do that, I, I just want to set the context for uh, how this fits into cancer care in general. And you, you're all aware of this, but I think it's worth just commenting on it. Um, Cancer really continues to be treated by three major uh, uh, therapeutic modalities. Taking the cancer out, which has been, it's been around for a long time, irradiating it, which uh, was really developed in the early part of the 20th century, 
And then uh, chemotherapy, which was developed in the mid-20th century, uh, uh, with a lot of that work actually being done on this side of the river at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, in the last uh, 20 years, there's really been two focuses. One is on the targeted therapies and also the immune-based therapies. And I want to start by commenting on the targeted therapies because one of the big themes that develop, that's developing in the therapy of cancer, of course, is combining these. So that's a theme that I'll try and emphasize during the, uh, during the talk. So this slide really represents two iconic uh, targeted therapies. On the top, you see uh, a BCR ABLE inhibitor. This one's a matinib. This binds to uh, the active site of a constitutively activated tyrosine kinase, which is due to the translocation of BCR and ABLE. And this is what drives almost 100% of chronic myelogenous leukemia. Um, on the bottom, what you see is an example of uh, a targeted therapy at uh, the activated kinase BRAF. Um, this is due to the uh, a, a V600, typically a V600E mutation in the BRAF uh, a molecule, and that results in about 50% of metastatic melanoma. Now, these are two very elegant medicinal uh, chemistry solutions to uh, large uh, medical problems, but they have very different outcomes. So in the case of the BCR ABLE in, uh, hip, it, inhibitors, you get a very robust, durable response. And that's seen here in this graph where uh, the red lines, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, deaths, uh, go down over the years that the, since the, um, these uh, molecules were introduced into the marketplace. So this has a really profound effect on the natural history of the disease. Other targeted therapies, unfortunately, give a very robust initial clinical response, and that's seen in this waterfall plot um, using one of the BRAF inhibitors. These are simply the number of patients that are responding to the therapy. You also see it in this picture on the right-hand side of the patient pre-dose, and then about, uh, I think it's uh, 15 weeks later, where all their lesions have cleared. Unfortunately, um, and this is the case in a number of targeted, uh, targeted therapies, uh, the disease returns, um, and this patient, this is about eight weeks later, and you can see he's only had about a couple of months of, of durable response. Now, one approach to this is to understand the resistance mechanisms, and that's an approach that the field has taken. So in this case, for example, um, sorry, this doesn't, oh, it shows up. Um, uh, one can look at what uh, arises either in the patient or in preclinical settings when you treat with a BRAF inhibitor. And one of the major, uh, one of the major pathways that then uh, uh, shows up are mutations in the MEK uh, um, molecule, which is downstream of BRAF, so not too surprisingly. So again, you can come up with a medicinal, solution, uh, medicinal chemistry solution to this, develop drugs against MEK, and then combine them. And of course, that's been done, and you can see in this uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, um, if you add a MEK inhibitor on top of a BRAF inhibitor, you can increase the response rates and the durability, but again, it's not a cure. So um, the industry, uh, and I use that term widely, that is the academic pursuit of, of uh, therapies and, and the, uh, uh, the commercial co uh, pursuit of some of these, uh, has really um, looked for orthogonal approaches. And one of the biggest ones as we're here to talk about is um, uh, is trying to engage the immune system. Now, I've just put up four of sort of the historical points that uh, suggest that the immune system is involved in, in cancer. Uh, Dr. Tang talked about um, uh, William Coley, who really is credited with recognizing the possibility that uh, the, the immune system could be used. And as, he, as Dr. Tang mentioned, uh, BCG actually is currently used in treating uh, local bladder, bladder cancer. Um, another uh, uh, um, clear, clear evidence that the immune system uh, is involved in treating cancer is from these so-called melanoma super responders. And here you see in around 3% of metastatic melanoma patients, sorry, early stage melanoma patients, around their lesion in the skin, they have a very dense intratumoral uh, lymphocyte um, uh, infiltrate. And that, when, after you remove it, um, if, if you have patients like that, they are actually associated with a very limited risk of recurrence. Um, we've talked about therapeutic antibodies. These have been around for about a, a generation now. Rituximab and trastuzumab are, are selected examples of that. And then one that's particularly important for uh, the, the T-cell therapies that were commented on and that I'll, I'll uh, detail a little bit later uh, is the graft versus tumor response where tumor cells from um, a, an allogeneic uh, 
hepato uh, hematopatic stem cell transplant, so you're getting donors from, from a different person, these can eliminate uh, a host tumor, and that's been known for, uh, for quite a while in, in the area. So now um, I want to step back and just remind you of some of the immunology uh, that you hopefully learned as an undergraduate, or if not, I'm going to give it to you in five slides. Um, and the reason I, uh, uh, I want to step back is that the um, focus in cancer really has been uh, in understanding the genetics of the tumor cell, really looking inside the cell uh, for the last generation or so of, of uh, looking at therapies. And I think we have to remember uh, that the, um, can't, the, the tumor, of course, grows in a, uh, uh, in a uh, large uh, environment that's called the body. Now, the immune system, um, as we're all aware, is a network of cells, tissues, organs, and molecules that are all working together to defend the body against uh, foreign, uh, foreign entities, as it were. The point I really want to emphasize on this slide is around the lymph nodes. Um, for two reasons. One is the lymph nodes are probably, the local lymph nodes near the, near the tumors are the site of where much of the critical action is going on to fight these tumors. And the other is that if you, um, you know, typically we get very small biopsies from uh, cancer patients. Uh, and what we actually see is a very limited uh, view into what's going on in the, in the tumor. If you get uh, whole tumors out though, and look, in a variety of cases what you will see is so-called either ectopic lymph nodes or tertiary lymphoid structures that are developing around the tumor. Um, and it is possible that those are sites that are critical for the immune system trying to uh, fight off that tumor. And that's an active area of research now we're trying to understand. Of course, it's difficult because you, you can't always get whole tumors from patients to understand, uh, to, to study. So what does the immune system do? It's really got to do four things. Um, it's got to recognize that um, something is foreign, and this is problematic in a tumor because the tumor uh, is actually generated from self-tissue. We generated it ourselves. Um, however, it does display uh, at times um, what are so-called neo or cancer antigens that, that uh, suggest to the immune system it's actually uh, uh, foreign. So this is one issue that comes up. The immune system, this has to mount a response to that foreign uh, uh, foreign body, and we'll come uh, in a little bit more detail into the cells that are involved in that. Then, critically, uh, the immune system has to regulate itself. So you can't have a rampant in inflammatory and immune response to a, uh, uh, to a foreign agent that isn't somehow self-limiting. This self-limiting aspect, as we've heard before, the tumor can then co-opt uh, to try and make an immunosuppressive environment. So we'll come to some of the tools that are involved in that. And finally, and this is really the most important part for, I think, our, our, uh, our, our goal of uh, ultimately, our ultimate goal of tumor immunology, which is to drive a memory response, because the, uh, the immune system has that. So you've got to recognize it, you've got to contain it, you've got to manage that um, uh, inflammatory response, and then you hopefully can drive a memory response. Now, the key, there are key cells involved here. I'm just going to go through some of these briefly. <clears throat> the macrophage, um, uh, which is a cell that engulfs and destroys pathogens and also can act as an antigen-presenting cell, uh, uh, it's not completely clear. Well, I should say probably the macrophage is both a good actor and a bad actor, depending on the um, uh, environment in which it's in. And I will comment uh, briefly on, on how we're looking at macrophages in, uh, from a uh, uh, clinical development side. Uh, natural killer cells are key in that they are actually one of the key cells that uh, can, uh, can kill tumor cells, and there's some work in the industry looking at trying to uh, either activate NK cells or bring them directly to tumors. Uh, I'm not going to comment on that today, but I just wanted to mention that it is an area that's being worked on. The two key players that I am going to emphasize are the dendritic cell, um, which plays a number of roles, including antigen presentation, and I'll, I'll uh, go into a little bit more detail there, and then the T cell component, uh, both the uh, effector, the helper, and the regulatory T cell component comment on that. Just to finish out on the cells, there's also, of course, the B cell, which can cr uh, create a humoral um, uh, 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 memory response to tumors in principle. And these are, of course, the ones that have been exploited to make passive antibodies, such as rituximab and trastuzumab. Um, mast cells, eosinophils, and basophils are probably less important in tumor immunology, although uh, we learn something every day, and maybe they will come to play a role. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the dendritic cells and uh, the uh, T cells. So the dendritic cell really does two key, uh, uh, key things in the, in, uh, uh, with respect to fighting tumors. The first is outlined here. Um, the dendritic cell is key at taking foreign proteins from uh, uh, an area f such as an infection or a dying, a dying tumor cell, uh, uptaking those, taking them up into the cell and then processing them and displaying them on an MHC molecule, either class one or class two molecule, to uh, the, the uh, uh, T cell. Now, we'll get to this in more detail, but this T cell interaction with the dendritic cell, along with other interactions, is incredibly exquisitely regulated. And this actually gives us a number of targets to, uh, to go after. A um, little bit more uh, detail on the T cells. Uh, they typically are divided into two types, CD8 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Um, these bind with uh, uh, the class 1 MHC and are key for act the actual killing of the cells. So, for example, in uh, the cell therapy, we think that CD8s are probably the critical ones for actually killing the tumor, although there's good evidence that you need both CD4s and CD8s to, to, to get a, a good response. Um, CD4s are the so-called helper T cells, um, uh, bind uh, antigen displayed by the dendritic cells uh, through the MHC class 2 molecule. And uh, they can uh, do a, a, a number of things, but they're typically divided into two key pathways. One in which is a cell that will drive an inflammatory response, such as through a macrophage, uh, and the other is to drive the humoral response and uh, help uh, drive the, the B cell maturation. The other key cell type, oh, sorry, I forgot that I did want to emphasize a little bit more about memory cells. Uh, these effector cells, uh, these cytotoxic T lymphocytes, um, after they've uh, done their job, as it were, uh, can survive for uh, quite a while as memory T cells. And we see them really in three settings. There are effector memory T cells uh, that uh, remain um, uh, uh, circulating and that these can actually, uh, after exposure to antigen, immediately offer protection. Um, there are memory cells that uh, uh, circulate and these, when they're um, exposed to antigen will now proliferate and differentiate into these uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells. And then there's been more and more emphasis on a new set of uh, cells called tissue resident memory cells. So these are cells that actually reside in the tissue. They do not appear to circulate, um, but are probably critically important to tumor immunology. The problems are hard to study because they aren't circulating and you can't get them out of the blood. Um, the other key uh, T cell that we should pay attention to are the regulatory cells, and these are cells that can attenuate the immune response after the pathogen is clear. Um, and for example, uh, uh, we, we'll talk a little bit about the CTLA-4 molecule, which I believe Dr. Tang brought up. This is one of the key interactions on, uh, with, uh, in, in T regulatory cells. All right, so cancer is an immunological disease, and as I mentioned, on the one hand, Tumor cells can be perceived as foreign because they've mutated their DNA. They can, they can, uh, uh, th that, that foreign DNA, as it were, can be uptake, uh, taken up by dendritic cells and displayed to T cells. Um, they can also be, uh, become, um, be perceived as dangerous because they've disrupted the natural tissue homeostasis. On the other hand, tumor cells retain many of the features of normal tissue. Um, that, and, and, uh, that tr trigger immune tolerance or an immunosuppressive environment. And they can create this immunosuppressive microenvironment that, uh, that facilitates immune es escape and ultimately tumor progression. So these are both areas that we wanna uh, focus on. And to put this in the context of then how we're going after uh, approaches, therapeutic approaches uh, to uh, immuno-oncology, um, there are really three major areas, and this diagram just puts what I mentioned into the context of a tumor. Uh, here's a tumor down in the lower left-hand side. Uh, uh, the tumor antigens, this is the uh, foreign DNA, are picked up by the dendritic cells. Um, they home to the, uh, a local lymph node where they recognize those, uh, t circ those rare circulating T cells that will recognize the antigen displayed by the dendritic cell. They proliferate and then move to the tumor to kill it. And you can imagine um, uh, therapeutically intervening or 
uh, amplifying in each one of these areas. So you can imagine uh, um, trying to create uh, uh, a, a more potent dendritic cell or a display of the antigen. This is what vaccines have been doing. You can imagine trying to repress uh, the uh, immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. Uh, and you can also imagine modulating that T cell function to drive a more potent T cell. So I'm going to start here and comment briefly on the checkpoints uh, that were brought up earlier this morning and also on the CAR T cells and where we are in the sort of the, the, the state of the industry there. So as I mentioned, the interaction um, uh, between T cells and, uh, and uh, the antigen presenting cells has to be incredibly exquisitely regulated um, because they, they have produced such a potent response to um, uh, a potent immunological response. So there are co-stimulatory signals that have to be displayed um, in parallel with the MHC molecule, and these can regulate the responsiveness of, of many of the immune cells. And then there are co-inhibitory signal, signals. These will promote tolerance um, and that they, they can cause uh, the T cell to become so-called uh, exhausted if the pathogen uh, is around for a long time. And this has really been defined in, in, the, uh, in, in uh, uh, the area of viral biology. Um, so you can imagine promoting a T cell response by agonizing this side of the equation, and you can imagine um, managing the response by, uh, or taking the brakes off the response, as it were, by blocking this side of the equation. And I will tell you that the industry has uh, active programs in uh, all of these molecules, um, Gitter, CD28, OX40, uh, so many of the molecules on this side as well. So the idea here is that um, uh, uh, for CTLA-4, for example, is that um, here you see a T cell being activated by uh, an antigen presenting cell and uh, there's a co-stimulatory receptor here, B7 binding CD28. Under both physiological and pathological conditions, um, you can regulate this by having this B7 ligand now bind a negative regulator, by, uh, like a CTLA-4. You can come in with a blocking antibody to this. Uh, this will now drive a positive response and you get T cell stimulation and uh, tumor cell death. Now, what I'm not showing on this slide is also CTLA-4 being a key component of the T regulatory um, interactions and that uh, blocking that also suppresses the T regulatory function. Now, you get uh, reasonable efficacy here, but of course you can get the flip side, which is toxicity, and uh, treatment with CTLA-4, for example, can result in colitis or rashes in the skin. It's just an example of the clinical benefits using um, uh, ipilimumab, which is the uh, antibody against CTLA-4. And the most important part of this is this tail, where you see about 20% of the patients, and this has gone out even further now, 20% uh, of the patients, these are metastatic melanoma patients with a durable response. If you look at historical uh, data in this, you really only see um, uh, uh, 5 to 10% of those patients having a durable response. So, this is significant to a number of patients. However, we have a long way to go to uh, uh, increase the, the efficacy. So one approach um, is, of course, to combine compounds. And the uh, pathway that's probably gotten the most popular press and been uh, most critical over the last uh, few years has been the so-called PD-1, PD-L1 program. Uh, sorry, PD-1, PD-L1 pathway. So PD-1 is an immunohibitory receptor that's expressed on activated T cells as well. Um, and when bound to its ligand, which is expressed on many uh, human tumors and many other cell types, quite frankly, uh, PD-1 is activated and this leads to basically T cell dysfunction. Um, if you block PD-1, and there are a number of monoclonal antibodies that uh, uh, are either on the market or being developed, uh, you can restore this uh, effector T cell function, leading to T cell proliferation and uh, activation against the tumor. Um, so you can combine these just as we did with the targeted therapies, uh, and you'll find that uh, addition of an antibody to PD-1 on top of that CTLA-4 uh, antibody not only gives you a more robust um, initial response, that's shown here in this waterfall plot, uh, but also um, uh, an increase in survival in the Kaplan-Meier curve and a, and a reasonably durable response. So this is a very exciting result, I think, for uh, certainly for metastatic melanoma. So I think the obvious question then comes up, why not combine them? 
And there's certainly a very strong rationale now for integrating immunotherapy and targeted therapies. Um, as I mentioned, the duration of tumor regressions with targeted therapies is somewhat limited. Um, immunotherapy seems to accomplish a reasonable, durable tumor control, but its response rates are, are, are low to a certain degree. Um, it's also the case that many of these targeted therapies, and this is another key area, is understanding what is the response of the immune system to some of these targeted therapies that has not been studied thoroughly. So they may, in fact, attenuate um, tumor-induced immunosuppression. Um, and um, combining, combining treatment obviously makes sense. Now, uh, us and other, uh, others are, are developing preclinical packages that uh, suggest that this is important. Here it is for metastatic melanoma. It's a paper from uh, uh, Jennifer Wargo's lab showing that in a patient who's been treated with um, a BRAF inhibitor in metastatic melanoma, you see a, a, a large infiltrate of CD8 positive cells around that tumor. Um, this is just individual patient data. Um, and then in a, this is a, a paper from uh, Tony uh, Rebus's lab um, in a, using a, a mouse model of that V600E uh, genetically engineered metastatic melanoma. And what you see there is if you look at the tumor, uh, those tumors treated with either a um, BRAF inhibitor or a MEK inhibitor show um, significant increase in PDL1 expression. And then if you treat w those animals uh, that have, with both um, a MEK inhibitor, a BRAF inhibitor, and an antibody against PD-1, you get the best beneficial uh, out outcome in that particular model. That's this blue line down here. So not surprisingly, uh, the industry is beginning combination studies with PD-1, CTLA-4, uh, BRAF and MEK, and I think one of the biggest in, uh, issues is going to be uh, how do we combine these, how do we sequence them, what, what, or what's the best way to approach that. Um, so I think, I'll pause there for a second, because I think metastatic melanoma has, has uh, or I should say, immunotherapeutic approaches to metastatic melanoma have transformed that disease over the last 10 years. There are numbers of patients now who, who are living who simply wouldn't have been 10 years ago. And while I don't think all the lessons that we're learning about combining targeted therapeutics and tumor uh, and, and uh, immunotherapies are going to hold, I think it shows us a paradigm of how to start to think about combining these things. So I want to give you an example of uh, another uh, checkpoint inhibitor that's being developed by the industry. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, the LAG3 gene. This is lymphocyte activation gene 3. This is also expressed across a number of activated T cells, and um, uh, it's really best known ligand is MHC class 2. Uh, we know that it negatively regulates T cell signaling and function uh, by binding class 2, uh, similar to the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway. Uh, and that blockade, just as blockade of PD-1 or CTLA-4, can result in, in um, uh, 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 stimulating the immune system to, um, uh, to kill tumors. Now, um, we know, also know that uh, in the case of PD-1 and LAG-3, uh, the expression of these uh, two molecules is highly correlated across uh, a number of indications. So this is data simply from the, the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, and if you look at uh, melanoma here, um, there's uh, lung and um, kidney cancers as well. These two molecules are highly correlated. Now, then the question is, well, if they're highly correlated, do they have redundant function? And um, the question is probably not. Um, there's uh, good evidence from animal models. So for example, if you look at the double deficient mice, these are mice deficient in both PD-1 and LAG-3, they develop rapid and lethal systemic autoimmunity much more quickly than either of the uh, single knockouts on their own. Um, and there's some evidence that if you combine an anti-LAG-3 and an anti-PD-1 antibody, you can increase the efficacy in select models of, uh, syngenetic models of, of, uh, of, of cancer. Um, so uh, I want to give you a little taste of um, how we develop um, molecules against uh, 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 these uh, uh, therapies against these molecules. And here's an example of a humanized antibody directed against LAG3. I think there are two in the, uh, in the clinic now. Uh, Novartis has one and Bristol-Myers Squibb has one. Um, and they're, 
most people, they'll, they're, they're probably reasonably similar. Um, what we look at, of course, is affinity on uh, the, the front end of the model. That is, how well is it binding to LAG3 and how well does it function? And that's just shown here. These are nanomol or inhibitors of, uh, of LAG3. But we also look at the back end of the antibody. So there's, of course, an FC sticking out there, and that has function of itself. Uh, in this case, we've actually removed that function by creating a, uh, an IgG4 molecule. So this is hopefully a molecule that binds to LAG3 but doesn't do a whole lot um, uh, to activate the immune system. Um, that's just some data showing uh, how these things are characterized. The other thing that the industry typically does is uh, look exactly where these antibodies are binding. So here you see a crystal structure uh, between the LAG3 fab, this is a piece of the antibody, uh, binding to, um, uh, to LAG3 itself. And what we know is that this is binding in the uh, region that's, uh, uh, that's reported to bind with MHC2. So it's uh, extra evidence that we're, we're binding to the, uh, uh, the important region of the molecule. So uh, then uh, typically um, what, what uh, the industry does is uh, get this into the clinic as quickly as possible and then combine it with uh, some molecule, in this case PD-1. Uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb has a uh, a trial running um, with this combination that I think there should be data reasonably soon at one of the public meetings, probably ASCO, uh, and uh, we have one running as well. Um, so that's an example of a new target in the, uh, in the um, checkpoint space. Um, so I want to move from the checkpoints uh, to the T cell therapy. Um, and. Um, I, I will focus on the, as uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Tang mentioned, there have been two approaches in the industry. One is to actually engineer the T cell receptor um, and uh, uh, do autologous cell therapy with that. I'm not going to comment on that this morning. I will focus on the chimeric antigen receptor technology. That's uh, an area that we've been working with the University of Pennsylvania for the last three years. <coughs> Um, and just so you understand how this is, uh, uh, this is done in some detail, these chimeric antigen receptors are generated by combining an antigen binding domain, typically an FCFV, uh, with a co-stimulatory domain uh, from, from some co-stimulatory receptor like 41BB or uh, CD28. Uh, and then the signaling domain from the T cell receptor, in this case it's CD3. So this is the construct that's actually being put into the T cell. Now you saw a slide similar to this. I'll just go through what actually happens to a patient who comes into, uh, comes into the clinic. Um, they, they are leukophorists, and their T cells are harvest, harvested. Um, uh, these, uh, so this is an ex vivo therapy. The T cells are then activated, um, typically through CD28 and CD3 uh, beads, and then genetically transduced with a construct, for example, like I showed you before. Um, these are then expanded for typically 10 days or so. They're uh, purified to a certain degree. Uh, typically in the leukemias, uh, the patients have lymphodepleting regimens, although this is, I wouldn't say it's controversial, it's something that's simply being explored in the field right now, whether you need to lymphodeplete a patient in order to engraft these uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And um, so th that, that is still, I would say, under, um, under investigation. And then the engineered cells are reinfused back into the patients. Um, one of the critical issues for this field is the antigen target, however, because at least to date, there's really not been a clear therapeutic index. So if you are expressing this antigen, there's a good chance the immune cells you put in are going to kill it. Um, so CD19 is an example of a a uh, very good uh, antigen because it's really restricted to B cells, B cell precursors, and B cell tumors. And so if you follow this at all, you'll see that the entire field right now has really been focusing on CD19. Um, however, the results with this have been pretty dramatic. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Tang mentioned Emily Whitehead this morning. She's one of these uh, pediatric ALL patients uh, where we've seen uh, close to 90% um, uh, complete response rates. And I, I want to emphasize that that's complete response rates. Uh, we typically talk about progression-free survival or partial responses in this field. These are, these are dramatic responses. And in some patients, we're seeing very durable, uh, durable responses. Um, for example, Emily is out a few years now. Um, it's been less 
uh, dramatic in uh, the adult tumors. For example, chronic uh, le uh, leukemia, the, the response rates are lower, and we have a number of active programs going, to, going on to try to understand why that response rate is so much different. However, what you do see in this patient population is that if they do respond, it's a very durable response. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, we have activities in, uh, in, in other lympho lymphomas as, as well. Now, this does not come without, um, uh, without toxicities. Now, the first obvious one is that because, C as I just mentioned, because CD19 is expressed on B cells, you remove all the normal B cells in those patients as well. So they have B cell aplasia, and they have to be treated with uh, IVIG. So one of, the, um, one of the areas of research right now is trying to build switches for these, uh, uh, for these CARTs so that you can remove those cells um, over time. Um, the other Big concern has been cytokine release syndrome, um, and that's in principle because you infuse uh, uh, these T cells in and they rapidly uh, expand and, and produce a, 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 a cytokine storm-like syndrome. This does not happen to all patients, but it can be very severe. So, for example, in the case of Emily, um, she actually... Uh, was rushed to the ICU um, before this dramatic response, um, and there was real concern that she was not going to make it because she had such a profound cytokine release syndrome. Um, fortunately, they were actually able to do um, immuno uh, cytokine profiling in, in, within 24 hours, and they identified IL-6 as one of the highest uh, cytokines and treated her with an IL-6 um, uh, an antibody actually against the IL-6 receptor, and she responded very rapidly, and that now has actually become part of the uh, toxicity management for this. I think this is primarily, this may be primarily related to the size of the tumor that uh, the patients have because you have so much antigen uh, 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 in, in play there, um, and so I think this will be managed clinically over time, either by de debulking tumor or managing the, the cytokine release syndrome. But it's, it's not something we should minimize. Um, I just want to comment that the industry does have other ways of redirecting these T cells, so taking T cells to the tumor. And uh, one of the most advanced ways is by simply making an antibody or an antibody fragment. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a tandem SCFV. Uh, it's got a piece that targets uh, CD3 on the T cell so that it can drag it in, and then an antigen tumor, uh, a, a tumor antigen antibody, just like a, a, an SCFV to CD19, and it simply drags the, the T cell in. Um, the most advanced is a molecule called blinitumumab from Amgen, uh, and it's also been developed in, uh, in uh, uh, leukemia. Um, so, uh, I just want to comment briefly on how this is uh, uh, being, this platform is being expanded. Um, it's clear that it's working well and, and potentially transformational in CD19 uh, B cell lymphomas. Uh, the question is whether A, it can be expanded to solid tumors and B, expanded into other leukemias. And we have two efforts in that uh, um, uh, space that I'll comment on. One is targeting the EGFR V3. Um, variant of EGFR and glioblastoma, and the others BCMA and multiple myeloma. Um, so we've generated uh, with Penn a uh, construct here um, uh, that's very similar to the CD19 construct, except that it has a SCFB directed against this tumor-specific isoform variant of EGFRV3, and it has a reasonably uh, large window between uh, what, how it hits the variant versus uh, wild-type EGFRV3. Um, this, uh, this variant's expressed in um, heterogeneously, but in a wide, wide number of GBM uh, uh, glioblastoma cases, uh, and we've recently put this in the clinic. It's actually with Marcella Maus, who's someone mentioned earlier this morning as well. She's just moved to MGH. Um, uh, and to make a, a reasonably long and complicated story short, what we are seeing in these patients, and this is true for other solid tumors that we've done, is that the, the cells um, uh, do proliferate in the periphery, but n nowhere near as much as they do in the hematological setting. We also know that the cells get to the tumor, so we can see the CAR T cells uh, in, in, the, in the tumor, but we aren't having the kind of dramatic uh, efficacy effects that we're seeing um, uh, with the, in, in the hematological uh, area. 
Um, so the obvious thing to do, which we're gearing up to do, is to combine these with checkpoint inhibitors, and that kind of work is, is, is uh, progressing. Um, BCMA uh, really is um, a, a, uh, an antigen that picks up uh, the B cells that are not um, uh, CD19 positive. So these are plasma cells, which um, uh, give rise to multiple myeloma. And you can see here, we've developed a CAR, again, very similar to the ones I mentioned before, that, um, is it, that uh, uh, binds BCMA, which is expressed on um, many multiple myeloma, uh, in many multiple myeloma patients. That, for us, has just entered uh, the clinic, um, uh, but the NIH has reported at a recent hash of, um, I think, three or four responses in their trial. So we are very uh, bullish on the fact that this, this uh, should work in uh, multiple myeloma. So I think there's very good evidence now that the CAR T therapy in lymph leukemias, lymphomas, and myelomas uh, could, be, uh, uh, could be important. Um, all right, so th those are the comments on, on sort of the, where the industry is going and trying to manipulate the T cell. Uh, I wanted just two slides on the tumor microenvironment because this is an area that's just starting to, uh, that the industry is starting to look at. Um, the first is one that's very popular in the, in the industry, and that's looking at, uh, at uh, inhibitors of the indolamine pyrrole uh, dioxygenase or the tryptophan uh, uh, dioxygenase. These two enzymes promote the accumulation of kynurenin, and this is an immunosuppressive byproduct of uh, tryptophan catabolism. Um, this promotes an immunosuppressive environment. I should say, along with a lot of other molecules, right, we heard about TGF-beta, um, adenosines in that mix, there are a number of things. So one of the concerns here, I'll just uh, editorialize, is how many of these uh, uh, pathways are going to be redundant, and how many do you actually have to block to, um, uh, to reverse the immunosuppressive environment. At any rate, this is a, uh, a key, uh, key pathway that's being, uh, being targeted, and um, there's a company called Insight that probably has the lead here, and their lead molecule is in a number of clinical uh, trials right now in combination with almost every other immunotherapy you can, you can imagine. Uh, another uh, immunosuppressive um, or sorry, uh, another uh, pathway that's being targeted uh, in, by the, in, the, in the microenvironment, as I mentioned, are macrophages. And uh, the, the molecule that's really going, being going after is CSF1, or uh, colony stimulated factor one, which recruits tumor associated macrophages, which in this case we believe are providing an immunosuppressive environment. And there are uh, two approaches to targeting this pathway. One is antibodies, both against the ligand itself and against the receptor, and also small molecules that block um, uh, the receptor kinase, uh, the, the uh, receptor kinase itself. And um, I should comment that uh, um, a number of uh, companies, including ourselves, have for a proof of concept, looked at this very rare synovitis called pigmented villonodular synovitis, um, which is basically a, a, uh, um, a proliferation of synovial cells around the joint. This is caused by a translocation of the collagen promoter to uh, CSF1, and, and, and this is a CSF1-driven proliferation of these cells. And uh, we and others now have shown in proof of concept experiments that both with the antibody and with the small molecule, you can really de decrease this completely. So we think the molecules are good. The question is now, will it be, will it, how will it apply in a, in a much broader cancer uh, setting? And right now we have uh, trials running in, in triple negative breast cancer. So that's another example of, uh, uh, of um, targeting the, the immunosuppressive environment. And as I mentioned, there are many uh, areas that we might imagine going here. The, question is prioritizing them and figuring out how best to do it. So the last part I want to comment on is how uh, the industry is really approaching immune priming. And that's trying to get these dendritic cells revved up to, uh, uh, to uh, stimulate the immune system to, to kill the tumor. And uh, this has been a somewhat, I'll just say, disappointing uh, uh, area for the, ther for the industry over the, um, over the last generation or so. And there have been many, many uh, attempts at doing this. Um, and part of this may be simply that, that uh, they're trying to attack an immunosuppressive environment, and then with the checkpoint inhibitors, this will change dramatically. 
Um, but I think this, first of all, I, I, I will editorialize again, I think this is the biggest area to break, uh, that's ripe to break out. Uh, we've seen something in the T-cell area, we're going to see stuff in the immunosuppressive area. This uh, is an area that's really uh, quite interesting. And for me, um, the, the key, uh, 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 one of the key areas that has um, emerged over the last year is this oncolytic virus um, that uh, was developed um, ultimately at, at Amgen. So talimogene, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this. I don't think anyone knows how to do it. Um, talimogene uh, is an oncolytic engineered virus, um, and it's got m modifications that allow it to have a, a therapeutic index. But this is an interesting study that, uh, w this is the phase three study that led to the approval by the FDA in October, where you're looking at the oncolytic virus um, versus just, which, which also expresses GMCSF versus GMCSF. Uh, and you can see that uh, not only is there a, uh, a window in the Kaplan-Meier, but you can see a, a, a tail starting to go here. Now, in and of itself, um, you know, this is a nice result. Uh, it's an important enough result that it was uh, filed. But I think for me, what's most critical uh, is the fact that this is delivered locally. Okay, so the, 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 the virus is given in three or four of the metastatic lesions, but you are seeing global effects. You're seeing systemic effects. Um, and for me, this is one of the, the first clear evidences, uh, at least from a randomized trial, of the so-called abscopal effect. So what's the idea there? The idea is that you can uh, locally stimulate the immune system at one site, um, Magic happens. You generate T cells. You generate an inflammatory response. And those T cells or warriors, whatever is happening, because we don't know molecularly exactly what's going on yet, uh, can go to other sites and destroy the tumor. Now, there's been a lot of anecdotal case study uh, published in the literature about the abscopal effect. And you can do it in mice all the time. But for me, this was the first clear evidence that, that you were seeing it in a, in a, in a large setting. Um, so, for me, I think that's a, a very exciting result, and of course, uh, telimogene is now being put in combination trials with uh, uh, all the checkpoint inhibitors that you can think of, and I'm, I'm uh, very interested to see what those results will be. Now, a, another approach um, is to, to, as I mentioned, um, dendritic cells not only process antigens and present them to uh, T cells, they also can sense foreign DNA, um, and they do that uh, through a molecule called sting. So sting senses and binds to uh, cyclic dinucleotides from foreign DNAs. And this is probably uh, similar to what the oncolytic virus is doing. It's, gonna, it's driving an innate response uh, around the tumor. And this results in an inflammatory response and a so-called interferon signature. You can, you can see uh, a, a, um, um, uh, you can see an immune response around the tumor. Now, the thing about uh, targeting the sting um, pathway is that you can actually do some medicinal chemistry here and come up with very, uh, uh, very good therapeutic um, compounds. And uh, we've um, recently done a, a, a collaboration with a small company called Aduro and, and are developing sting agonists. And the therapeutic hypothesis is pretty straightforward. It's that this activation in the tumor microenvironment will promote this innate and adaptive anti-tumor immunity, and that this is going to lead to the systemic immunity. So going back to the abscopal effect, you can simply deliver a small molecule uh, locally here and hopefully have a systemic effect. Okay. And a couple of slides just showing that this works in mice. As I mentioned, the abscopal effect has been demonstrated uh, in many uh, different settings in mice. But here you're looking at um, a dual flank model where you inject uh, uh, the, one of the sting agonists into one of the tumors. Um, you can destroy that tumor, um, but then you also have an adoptive response and you can, resp you can uh, destroy the uh, tumor on the other flank. You can then ask, have you actually created a memory response to this tumor uh, where you re-challenge the mouse? So here you give, uh, again, locally, you give the sting inhibitor to a mouse the uh, tumor is uh, destroyed. You then come back and implant another tumor, uh, and um, without any further injections, you can destroy that tumor. So manipulating this pathway, I don't think will be trivial in the clinic, but uh, I think we now have uh, some of the tools to, uh, uh, to approach it. Um, so I'll end there and just uh, sort of sum up by 
commenting that uh, you know surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy really are, remain the foundation of cancer treatment, and all of the things that I've talked about this morning are going to be done in that context, either in combination or in consolidation therapy, however we do it. I think targeted therapies, which we've spent um, the last 20 years or so working on, they can demonstrate profound but not necessarily durable clinical responses in genetically selected patients. Our checkpoint inhibitors have demonstrated durable responses, but not in all patients, so we have some uh, work to do there. And the cell therapy I've mentioned has shown profound and durable responses, but in very select patient populations. And I think the current technology really, we're going to have to see how generalizable it's going to be over time. So uh, I, I come to the perhaps obvious con conclusion that uh, uh, the goal now is to combine many of these tools that we have available to us and also start to expand our immunomodulatory therapeutic areas. And I, for one, think that immune priming side is really, as I'm repeating myself, is ripe for, uh, uh, for harnessing. And uh, um, I think the future continues to look very bright for creating these durable responses for patients. And I'll end there. Questions. Um, I should mention something that I forgot to say at the beginning that um, this previous uh, presentation was not eligible for CME credit. Um, we're required to make that announcement. Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. Yes? So, uh, what do you think about selecting patients for inhibitor receptor therapy? So, for example, selecting patients for PD1 therapy? Oh, like Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the field is doing, and then I can sort of comment on where I think, th think that that's going. Uh, there, are two, there are two big markers that have appeared. One is PDL1 expression, um, and in fact, the FDA is asking those, uh, um, in, those, those companies that are working on that to come up with some kind of common approach to looking at PDL1 expression. I think that's um, uh, somewhat problematic in that PDL1 PDL1 is going to be a very dynamic marker, and uh, it's also very difficult to um, uh, come up with common immunohistochemistry screens. That being said, that is what is going on right now, and that probably will be part of the uh, uh, I shouldn't say standard of care, but part of the approach to choosing patients. The other one is actually uh, mutation burden, um, and uh, there's I think arguably better evidence now that patients who respond to, to uh, uh, tumor therapy have a, a much higher tumor uh, mutation burden uh, when you sequence their tumors. Um, that may over time become a better predictor, but uh, there isn't clinical, there isn't uh, prospective clinical evidence for that, so we haven't, you know, validated those, those data yet in the clinic. Um, uh, for me, actually, the, probably the best evidence that someone's going to respond, uh, although you can't always get this, is simply their CD8 infiltrate. Do they have an active infiltrate when you go to treat? That's not so easy to always know, but I'm guessing if we could come up with a, uh, a, a good way to understand that, that would be, or perhaps a ratio of the CD8 effector cells and the, the T regulatory cells, which you can easily see through FOXP3 or there are other markers of that. clinical scenarios such as transplant, organ transplants, and what we see there is repeated injections of antibodies leads to neutralizing antibodies in the patients, and there is sort of a clinical phenomena called phylaxis, which develops, which uh, basically indicates a blunting of clinical response after, uh, you know, repeated injections. Do you see that phenomena with these uh, antibodies? So for... Um Ipilimumab and nivolumab, so some of the market products, I don't know the data specifically. I can comment on that generally, though, because I've worked on, for example, rituximab and, uh, uh, and um, uh, the uh, tisabri, I'm blanking on it, natalizumab um, in my past. What we see is that you almost always get some uh, humoral response to even a humanized um, uh, antibody, perhaps not surprisingly. What what you don't necessarily see, and this is even true in rituximab, which is a murine antibody or it's a chimeric antibody, they don't tend to be neutralizing. 
Um, and that, that gets measured uh, even in, in uh, post, um, uh, uh, post-marketing studies. And uh, you know exactly why that is, I, I don't know, but um, uh, we have not seen in the field that this is a particularly uh, large effect, either affecting efficacy or the other thing you can imagine is PK. I mean, they're related, but uh, yeah. So, so far that has not been a big issue. And I have heard nothing in the, um, the PD-1 field or the CTLA-4 field that that's been an issue. So you mentioned these CAR T cells can infiltrate into the tumor but didn't do a very good job. Can you comment a little bit more like um, why is that and because they get exhausted quickly in the tumor environment or because of any other reasons? Yeah, so I, I mean the, 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 the short answer is we don't know. Um, I, I think uh, you can imagine in it, let me back up. You can imagine in the hematological setting, one of the reasons it's working so well is your tumor's right there and you've got a ton of proliferating T cells right there. So trying to create that, and, and we don't exactly know what the stoichiometry of that has to be, right? Trying to create that in uh, solid tumor sites around the body is just not so, uh, uh, not so, not so clear. Now, in preclinical models, I know, for example, we've done, uh, or Carl's done uh, trials with an anti-mesothelin uh, 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 CAR T cell, and we see the s similar things, that the cells get to the, the lesion, but they don't proliferate that much. In preclinical models, uh, in our models that don't respond to the mesothelin CART, for example, you can see a ring of pdl one expression right around the tumor. So you can imagine that, yeah, um, uh, the, the tumor environment may be ma regulating the uh, uh, the CAR T's once they get there, and I, I think we'll just have to try combinations to see. The other thing you can imagine is, is do you need a circulating antigen, right, that the CAR T's recognize in the periphery to get them to proliferate a little bit more? We've sort of talked about those kind of things too. Yeah, I, I think that the short answer is it really matters what's going on in the tumor. And the, the only caveat to that, I'd say, is that um, work coming out of Steve Rosenberg's lab, who's really pioneered this, is, has, has shown in, and now I forget whether it's metastatic melanoma or, or, or renal cell, uh, that he can pull out PD-1 positive cells from the periphery that show the same um, neoantigen expression as they see in the tumor. So one could imagine that if that was a generalizable or scalable, that you could um, actually identify the, the T cells that are circulating that probably are doing the tumor killing that, that might be important, but that's the first inkling I've ever seen of, of pulling something out of the periphery that's meaningful to the tumor. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you had that early, does that help the patient in any way, or is it still going to progress the same Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. It's easier for me to think about that in a targeted setting um, where we're looking for specific circulating mutations or, or something like that. Uh, to date, um, I, I mean, the cytokine release syndrome, although we do have some efforts going on in there, quite frankly, I think is going to be managed at the, at the clinical level. That is. Uh, as I say, either debulking so you don't have such a robust um, uh, uh, cytokine storm, or even ma just managing the uh, um, uh, the inflammatory response. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer, <laughs> at least sitting here on the podium today. I don't know of studies specifically looking at PDL1 expression, but there's a whole field right now emerging around the epigenetic regulation of T cell function and uh, T cell ma maturation. Um, 
looking at you know the common targets like ECH2. I, I think it's a, an important area. <laughs> Um, so, so the answer is yes, um, but to be honest, the um, and although we're working on this, the understanding of the signaling that goes on probably the best understood is PD1, PDL1, and it is not well understood. And what I mean by well understood is, for example, the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, where we know we can go after BRAF, MEK, ERK, all these molecules. So, I think the what's going on inside the cell that area has to develop a lot more before we can really target it with small molecules. Now, there are some efforts at targeting directly the interaction of, for example, PD-1 or PDL one that interface. But I, I've got to say that the history of industry trying to find small molecules that block those kind of interactions, those protein-protein interactions, is, is not great. That's a really hard, hard way to go. Yeah. Darren, did you have a question? So, um Yeah, so um, let me just back up for one second and say, uh, you know, I think as a field, we want to think about what are the best solutions for these different tumor types. And it may be that CARs are not the best solution to solid tumors. So that being said, um, uh, if I want to, if we want to improve um, our, uh, 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 at least attempts at those, I think there are a number of ways to go. Uh, and I've mentioned a couple of them. One is just the you know, the, the obvious one, which is combined with checkpoints where you see PDL1 or PD1 upregulation around the tumor. That's one. Uh, the second is, and, and we and others in the industry are doing this, is looking at other signaling molecules. It may be that the signaling, the co stimulatory molecules, for example, aren't the right ones in the setting of, of the. Uh, uh, of the tumor. That's a car design issue, and I, 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 that's one piece of it. There's a lot of car design issues that we can uh, talk about. You can also imagine directly delivering um, with the car an anti uh, immunosuppressive, like a TGF, uh, the soluble receptor you heard about. You can imagine co expressing a car plus um, something that blocks the immunosuppressive environment. That's another approach. Um, I, there are a number of ways to think about it. Um, yeah, I, I can com comment that it's it's an important compartment that we're worried about. Um, we have active research going on in that area to look for what would be the appropriate targets, but right now they're sort of uh, um, you know uh, gross approaches like the macrophage uh, MCSF one, like I would, uh, th that kind of thing. Um, Yeah, no, I, I just saw that, although I, I guess I'd uh, reiterate my comment that just trying to understand what the pathways are that are managing uh, this, uh, P, just PD-1 and PD-L1 uh, dynamic expression, I think just needs uh, more work and validation before, you know, you really know what target you want to go after, but it, it, it's an important point. Well, I'd like to uh, thank our speaker, Dr. Rob. Uh, for lunch is to uh, file out this direction and then 
around this barrier to the um, northern hallway, coming back through the, uh, the eastern um, space where you'll pick up lunch and back to your table. For uh, a cure lymphoblastic leukemias, so uh, this is this is phenomenal. I, you know, when you think about cancer therapy, right? You always talk about you don't talk about complete remissions too much. So having ninety percent, I I just can't imagine. So that gives me a lot of excite. You know, that really energizes me. You know, it's like. For, I feel like for the first time, after, you know, for 15 years I've been doing, you know, science and, and, and genetic engineering, I feel like I can make a difference for, you can actually, maybe there's a chance that you can actually cure cancer. Um, so we all know that, you know, this is a very promising technology, but at the same time it's not perfect. And, you know, to some extent, that's why I have a job. I get to stand up here and talk to you guys because this, this technology is not perfect. So there, there are many, many problems with it. One of them is, uh, is this off-target and then these adverse side effects. Basically, the goal here is that you want to engineer these T cells so that you can kill tumor cells, right? That's the goal. But at the same time, we've seen in the clinics that you know, these T cells can be activated. They can be so strong that they can cause cytokine release syndromes. And then uh, they can also, if you don't have the right specificity, it can also target normal tissue and it can be very dangerous. So, um, then what? Okay. So I'm going to inject some politics into my talk, which could be a very, very damaging to my career. So for those of you who's Republicans, or don't hate me, right? <laughs> so we all recently, right, um, our president uh, have announced that, you know, uh, he wanted to take a shot, a cancer moonshot, basically trying to end the cancer, uh, the war on cancer. Um, as an engineer, this is very appealing to me. Right? Also, as a naive young assistant professor, why not? Right? Let's take a moonshot at, at cancer. So, um, 2020 seems very ambitious, so we'll see. Now, I have a, a, my visions of how I think we can you know, take a step forward towards this direction. So, this could also be very damaging to my career. So, <laughs> so here's what I think. I think that if we ever have complete control over the immune system, we might actually cure cancer, okay? And I think to achieve that, I think surgery is important, drugs are important, antibodies are important, but you cannot achieve complete control. That means that over every aspect of the immune system, you cannot achieve complete control without doing genetic engineering. So I think that if we ever want to conquer cancer, if we ever want to end this war, genetic engineering, cell-based therapy has to be part of the arsenal. Okay? I don't think it will replace other therapies, but I think this has to be part of the arsenal. So what I'm going to tell you for the rest of the talk is some of the effort uh, in, you know, in, you know, by others, and me as well, some of the synthetic biology effort, a lot of genetic engineering effort, uh, in trying to move in this direction. So I must say that a lot of these is baby steps, okay? And I, but that's what I say to my grad student too, is that even though I think these are baby steps that I'm gonna talk about, I think it's important, these baby steps are uh, big deals. Um, so now let's just give you a little summary. So, you know, this is, I'm not the only one who's in this field. There's a lot of people working on this. So one of the first things, first people have to make sure that these therapies are safe. We've seen that there are toxicity, the off-target effect. So there's a lot of people developing very different genetic tools to control these toxicities. There are kill switches that people have developed. Um, some of these are, uh, there are various different kill switches 
that people have, have made. If you want to read more about it, there's a lot. Of, uh, you can go through these uh, references. Now, there's other types. So that was, you know, these are kill switches. Basically, what that means is that if something goes wrong, you hit, like, you know, abort button. You know, you hit this, like, panic button, and then you kill off all the cells that, that's causing trouble. Now, part of it, you also want to prevent trouble. So what that means is that you also want to make sure that uh, it will be able to target cancer cells and not attack uh, healthy tissues. There are various ways people have been, uh, have tried. They're uh, basically developing a, a car that's called ICAR, these are inhibitory car, basically cars that attach to uh, inhibitory signaling domain rather than activation domains. There are logic gated car, basically what that means that you need two antigen on the surface of the cancer cell in order to fully activate the T cell. I'll go over a little bit more uh, in, in these in, in later, uh, 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 later part of this talk. There are on switches, basically not only does the, the car cell, the, the car T cell has to find antigen on the cancer cell, but you also have to supply an exogenous drug so that you turn on the, the whole T cell program. And then there are these uh, uh, mass cars, basically the car is not active until, uh, you know, until it finds the tumor antigens. Uh, also, uh, there, there's, a, there's a mass that covering the, the car molecule, and then that gets cleaved out by, by, by uh, proteases in the tumor microenvironment. So some of the work that I've also, so uh, those, are, those are receptor design. Um, my, there's other works. This is when I was a postdoc. We developed uh, signaling control circuits as well. Basically, there are these feedback control mechanisms that we develop. Basically, uh, when T cell is active, you express it, it causes a gene expression of a negative factor that can uh, limit the T cell response. So this way, you can tune the maximum activation levels. We also have an off switch. Basically, it's a simple drug-inducible expression of these effector. So you add a drug, it dials down, not kill off the cells, but dial down the activity uh, of the T cell. So that, you know, uh, you don't get this over-response effect, but at the same time, you're not killing off the cells. And then uh, separately, uh, the, uh, Yvonne Chen, now she's at UCLA, she developed at, uh, basically a a drug-inducible control of interleukin-2 and interleukin-15, so, so these allow them to control growth, specifically, uh, of the engineered T cells. So instead of fully, active, fully controlling the whole program of T cell response, you can separately control certain aspects of the T cell functions. So, so these are backgrounds. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna tell you some of the things that I do in my lab, some of the few baby steps that we've been trying to take uh, to more move toward this complete control uh, paradigm. So there's a lot of things that my lab is uh, going after. Uh, some of these, we're also building different versions of kill switches. I, in my opinion, I think you will never have enough kill switches. Okay, I think you know one of them maybe allows you to kill 99% of the cells, but you really want to go like 99.9999%. Right? You, so in my opinion. Uh, you really want more than one just to, as a backup. And then um, we're also developing a lot of different internal sensors so that it can sense it's not just tumor antigen, but also uh, the state that the cell is in, and that might correspond to the extracellular environment, maybe acidic, acidity, hypoxia, or other kind of signaling that's very specific to the tumor microenvironment. Um, we're developing on-off switches. When then also, some of the things that I'm very excited about are these things, uh, biocomputers. Basically, it's a logic platform that allows you to make any kind of logic computations. So I'll tell you a little bit about that toward the end if I have more time. And then um, some of these multi-state switches. What, I'll tell you more as well what that means. Basically, it's a, it's a way, it's a genetic circuit that allows the cell to be in various different states. And you can trigger them using drugs and maybe eventually light. And then finally, um, we have a, we're working on a new uh, chimeric antigen receptor system that allows you to do logic 
at the receptor level. So, so let me talk about this multi-state switches first. So one of the big problem in the uh, chimeric antigen receptor field is that this, this, this uh, prob effect of on-target, off-organ effect. Basically, is that a lot of the so-called cancer antigen, it's overexpressed in cancer cells, but it's also expressed at low or normal level in, in regular healthy tissues. And then the idea is that you can develop these chimeric antigen receptor that binds to these, these uh, antigen very well, but then they might not be able to tell the difference between high and low level, right? It's, it's basically a threshold issue. So um, we have seen these, you know, if you don't tune these uh, threshold properly, uh, you, you can, uh, the fatalities in clinical trials. So, so what does that really mean? So I, I think about these things in terms of like dose response profile, right? You have, this is ligand concentration or the antigen concentration on the cell surface. This is, let's say, T cell response, right? If you have a very sensitive chimeric antigen receptor, basically this is the type of, you know, you can imagine this is the type of uh, dose response profile that you will see. And basically off-target healthy tissue will also trigger a very substantial response, you know, and not much different than, than normal tissue. And that way, you, it's basically, you're hitting everything. Even though you're, target, you're hitting the target well and not anything else, but you're still not attacking the right organ. So one thing is that you need to be able to basically have this tuning of thresholds. Okay? And the idea is that, well, why don't you just find the right receptor, then, then you're done, right? right threshold. But the question I always have is that, how do you know which one is the right threshold, right? It's probably different for every patient, right? And it might work for some, whatever receptor you, you have might work for some patient, it might not work the other patient. So I ask, can you have a way to tune the threshold of these T cells dynamically? Okay, so that it basically allows you to to adjust how the patient responds. So the concept is this. So first, you, you start off with a very high threshold receptor and see whether, so that means that uh, you need very high expression of the, the antigen on the cancer cell in order for you to trigger the, the chimeric antigen receptors. And then you, if that works well, you have yourself a cancer therapy, then you're done, everybody's happy. But let's say this is not right. Can you sort of dial down the threshold, okay? And see if it works. So basically, it's a, it's a way of <coughs> adjusting not only the, the amount, you can adjust the amount of cells that's pretty easily, but what I wanna do is develop a genetic circuit that allow you to tune thresholds. The way I wanna do this is Basically, you start expressing a high threshold chimeric antigen receptor for particular targets. And then you can actually add a drug and switch off the expression of this high threshold and then turn on the expression of this like, medium threshold. And then ultimately, if this doesn't work, you turn on even lower uh, threshold, more sensitive, high affinity, low threshold cars. So, this type of switching, um, so one thing I also want to do with this type of sw switches is that to have memory. So what I really want is that you want these, so basically these are drug inducible system, like gene expression system. But what I also want is, is this, you, you don't want to keep, we, we, I, I you know, you, you can always, let's say you, you can have a gene expression system where you always add a drug so that it, it, it triggers the gene expression, okay? But then that means that the patient always have to be on the drug, okay? That could be dr good if you're a drug company, okay? You can keep selling the drugs. If, if you need this for forever, then you keep selling this drug to the patient forever. That's great if you're drug companies. Um, I don't think it's that great for a patient. So 
what if you can develop a system with memory? Basically, a lot of gene expression systems, gene switches, where you need to add a drug and then uh, it, to, to turn it on, when you remove the drug, the gene expression goes down. But if you have a memory, you can add a transient uh, addition of drugs and then the, the, the gene expression remains on. So to do this, I have decided to use one of the most reliable switches that's known in, in mammalian genetics. And these are the uh, recombinase system. These are the, especially the tyrosine recombinase systems. So basically these are genome editing enzymes. Okay, and such as one of the most famous examples is the Cree, Cree lock system. What they do is that you can engineer these specific uh, binding sites in the DNA, in the genome, and then you can flank these sites between uh, whatever genes that you want. And then if you express this, these tyrosine recombinases can actually cut it out. Okay, basically recombine these two sites and then remove anything in between it. So this is a stable modification of the genome. And then actually this enzyme uh, can do inversions as well, depending on the orientation of these sites, it can do inversions. And this inversions is actually, we call them unstable. That means that it will keep on spinning around. But this is actually a neat, neat trick uh, to use. So what um, I decided to use is this. There's this flex switch out there. People have developed it for like almost 15 years now. There are basically genetic engineering tricks with this uh, recombinate system. You, you can arrange these uh, recombination sites such that um, you can have a, a gene here, let's say this is high threshold cars in this slot, flanked by two different uh, uh, recombination sites for Cree, and then you can have a low threshold car in the anti-sense orientation. So in this basal configuration right here, this is just two states, only this high express high affinity, uh, I mean high threshold car is expressed. This one right here, which is in the anti-sense orientation relative to the promoter is not expressed. And if you supply Cre through the magic of these enzymes, just, just trust me, it will, it will invert the DNA such that it cuts out this high, expression, high threshold car and only the, and at the same time invert the low threshold car to the proper orientation and move it next to the promoter, such that now the low threshold car is expressed. You can actually keep on expanding that if you have more recombinases and orthogonal uh, and, and all these uh, binding sites. So we tried it. So one of the enzymes we found, actually I, I drew, I use Cree because that's what most people use uh, in, in the literature but Cree is actually very toxic, we found. Overexpressing Cree kills the cells. There's a much better one, less used, called flipase. There's no known toxicity have been documented. Like no, no toxicity has ever been documented for, for flipping mammalian cells. I'm surprised people haven't used it as much as they should be. So it, it's been great. It works really well, almost as active as Cree. And we built basically a flex system using flip and have a low affinity, uh, 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 this is a low affinity high threshold car and this is a high affinity uh, low threshold car. So, and then the way we control FLIP is by doxycycline inducible gene expressions. So, so basically, if you add doxycycline, FLIP will be expressed. It will cut out uh, A right here and then expresses B. Okay. So here's the data right here. So what we did is we actually uh, did this in, uh, in, in cell lines at, the, at this moment. Uh, the card is tagged with the fluorescent protein so that we can see in facts and flow cytometry, see uh, uh, whether they express or not. So here, uh, actually the two cards are tagged with different fluorescent proteins so we can see them uh, simultaneously. So at day zero with Dell drug induction, you see we have about 50% of the uh, T cell expressing the car. And then at day 19, if you uh, um, induce, you start reducing the number of cars in, in uh, uh, the number of cells that has the cars, but 
you can start seeing that uh, the high affinity cars start coming up at day 19. So you see the switches. So right now we're trying to make sure it you know, reaches 100% uh, <coughs> at this moment. What's also very nice about this system is that it, you, can, you can flip any DNA elements. They don't care. This enzyme doesn't care what you're flipping around. Okay? So what we found is that you can actually flip promoters around as well. And we found like EF1 alpha, surprise, which is the one, the promoter that's used to drive all the car expression in the clinics. We found that if you put the car, the promoter, in the reverse orientations, that means that you know, it, it actually drives gene expressions as well. Okay? So I, it's actually not that surprising. If, um, a lot of time the promoter, all it does is it recruits a polymerases, RNA polymerases. As long as you have enough of them it will, around there, it will drive gene expressions. So we actually inverted the, the, the EF1 alpha promoter. We see some basal expression, and then we can actually use, use uh, flip to flip it around. So basically, this allows you not only, to, uh, not only to switch which genes you want to express, but the level of that you want to express. And this is stable. When you add a drug, it changes from like low level to high level, and it remains that way. Okay, you don't have to keep adding the drug. So it's, what's nice about it is that your expression level is no longer tied to the pharmacokinetic of the drugs, right? Which you know, we all know that it can fluctuate over time. So this is the data about the car expressions. If you have no flip, it remains at low level, and then you have flip in the high level. So we're now working on having a drug-inducible system control flip as well. So three-stage switches, this is what I you know, ultimately wants to do. So what we, what we are limiting right now is availability of like a really good drug-inducible system. That, can, that works well with these recombinases. Okay. Now, so that was, um, you know, dynamic switching of state. So uh, even I talk about cars, in theory, it could, you can switch between any gene. You can switch between cytokines. You can switch between, let's say, you know, cars to cytokines, for example. It, it doesn't really matter. They don't really care, that system. Now, that system, if you focus on cars, right, in essence, I basically pack, you know, two or three therapies in one system, right? That's, in essence, that's basically what's happening. Um, but, you know, that system has a limited capability. It, you can tune threshold, you can tune targets, but what, and, and it has, you know, stable memories. But what, what, what happened, what if you want some logic computation capability. That means that what, what you want to be more specific to a certain cancer cell, right? You want to be able to, um, you know, have, have more, more control and also maybe even some temporal control where you don't need memories, right? So we've been working on a, uh, a you know, a new chimeric antigen receptor systems. Um, basically, it's a, it, it basically acts as smart tumor sensors. So it can integrate not, you know, not only tum you know, markers or antigen from tumor cells, but also signals from healthy markers, uh, healthy cells, right? So that they know that, okay, this is healthy tissue. Don't attack them, right? Can you develop a sensor like that, right? This will be very nice because it allows you to improve the discrimination between tumor cells and healthy cells. So let me go back to um, different types of car designs, right? So this is the car design that, that we are all very familiar with by now, hopefully, right? I expect every one of you become a car expert right by now. So this is a single chain variable fragment on the extracellular surface, directly fused to signaling domain from the T cell receptor signaling pathways. There are actually these uh, combinatorial system, uh, such as dual car, where you, you basically split this one car into two, and then each one of these, like you have the CD3 zeta signaling domain, and then the co signaling domain, 
and then each one of them is fused to two different antibodies. So basically, you need the cancer cell to express both antigens in order to fully activate the, two, uh, the T cell activations. The, the challenge of this is that at this moment, you can only do two. That's it. Okay, you only need two, really. So you can only do two uh, uh, sync nodes. And then also, this system is kind of like hardwired, hard-coded into the, into the T cell, right? If you want to change target, let's say you find out that this is not the right target, then you got to re-engineer the T cells again, all right? Which could be very expensive, time-consuming. And people, many, you know, uh, other people have tried this basically a uh, split car system. So basically, you have a sort of a, a receptor that doesn't have any specificity, but it has a recruitment domains, such as in strap Avidin. And lately, people have tried other types of recruitment domains. And then fuse that to signaling domain from the, uh, the intracellular signaling domain from T cell receptor. And what, so this portion, which is part of this T cells, has no specificity towards any specific cancer antigen. In order for you to have cancer specificity, you apply an antibody fuse to, for example, in this case, biotin so that you can actually, you act the T cell and this antibody biotin conjugate. So this is very nice, allows you to basically hot swap antigen, right? If this the antigen doesn't work, you apply another one, and then you can, what's nice about this system is that you can, you can dose different antibodies to the patient, so to, using that way to tune the activity as well. Now, all these things are great. What will be better is that you have a, a lot of these interaction domain that you have verified so that they're orthogonal and sometimes might not be complete orthogonal so that you can do some clever tricks with it. So we have developed what I call a, a split universal programmable and reconfigurable system. I call it Supra. So this is paying a, you know, homage to, to a, a brand of car that, that I grew up with. They don't exist anymore. Um, if you're Asian, you probably remember them. <laughs> so what's nice about this system is that you, you have these little tricks. If you have a lot of these pairs that you, that you identify, then in theory, you can use them to control different signaling pathways. Okay? And they, they don't have to interact. If you can make them interact, you can as well. And then that's why you can now choose which kind of signaling pathway you want to you want to activate by by adding these different antibodies. Okay, you can have them be co-stimulatory signaling. You can have them to be inhibitory signaling as well. So you can have them, you know, and and not kind of logic, right? Nimply and things like that, right? Which will be very very cool. So we tried um, some of these uh, domains where we have these, you know, let's call it beta, the exact identity is not that crucial <laughs> for, 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 for this talk. You try this beta domain fused to the uh, intracellular signaling, and then you have this antibody fused to, let's say, the alpha domain. And then this antibody can recognize its tumor antigens, and basically if you supply all these together, you should be able to activate T cell in, and have it specifically target cancer cell. So we tried it. So we have a system where this is HER2. This is anti-HER2 single variable, train, uh, single variable fragments with A and B uh, domains. The B is on the T cells. The A is fused to the antibody. And, and we look at, this is primary T cell data. And you can see here, if you supply the, the, the antibody with the A domain, you get a lot of interferon gamma productions. If you put a D B domain right here, which won't bind to B, so these are not homodimers, then it won't activate. So this illustrates that, our, at least in principle, our system works. We actually screen a lot of these orthogonal moieties. We actually found a couple pairs. We just named them three and four, uh, you know, six and thirty-four. These correspond to the specific number that we. We, we, we designate in our, in our lab. So basically, the take home message is that we found uh, at least three very good orthogonal pairs, 
we actually have uh, six that's kind of good. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. So these are, you know, if you put the receptor, uh, put these uh, uh, target, targeting domains on the target, uh, the, these uh, moiety on the, uh, on the target cells, or you put the other ones in the effector cells, we actually look at uh, T cell activation as reported by NFAT GFP. So NFAT is part of the signaling pathway that gets turned on when T cell, recept uh, when T -cell is activated. So one thing we also really want to do is that we want to be able to tell them, tell the cells that, okay, don't attack these types of tissues, right? No matter what you do, don't go after the heart, don't go after the lung. So you need to be able to have, you know, have a way that can shut off signaling, right, if it encounters certain antigens. So we were inspired by the work by uh, Seth Lane's lab where they actually fuse PD-1 signaling domain or CDLA4 domain to, uh, to an antibody they develop, they call them ICAR. So we want to see whether we can do, apply similar concept to our system. So what we have right here is these are T cell, effective T cell that expresses uh, the beta domain connected to, you know, the, the intracellular signaling domain from the T cell receptor. So this is a, you know, kind of like the, almost like a regular car. And then as, but we also express this at either just the beta alone that connects, doesn't connect to any signaling domain, or the beta also connect to PD-1 signaling domain or CTLL, CTLA-4 signaling domains. Okay. So basically, if you apply an anti HER2 antibody that's fused to the A domains. In this case, you expect to have activations. In these two cases, you expect to, to actually inhibit the T cell response. So it turns out that it actually mirror the settling paper that's published in Science Translational Medicine a couple of years ago. We tried the PD-1 domain, we have pretty good robust inhibitions but CTLA-4 just doesn't work really well. It just doesn't work. Uh, we, I think that's what settling seen as well in, in their work. So right now we're trying to move into uh, more primary cell work, do more logic regulations uh, uh, with this type of system, with, with our systems, and then moving into mouse studies. So this is very preliminary, not, you know, not not clinical stage yet, not, not recruiting patients <laughs> anytime soon, but we're pretty excited about the prospect of these things. Okay, I still have about five minutes-ish or so. Um, I'm gonna tell you one of the, actually the major development in my lab, um, but since this is a more cancer uh, targeted audience, so I'll just give you a brief overview of uh, this is our biocomputer system. So this is a, I, I, in my mind, it's a very novel and revolutionary uh, computation, genetic computation platform. Basically, it, it's a way of taking in multiple signals, let's say two, three, four signal, and then ask, you know, can you, can you do a, a, a simple computation, such as can you, let's say, do an AND gate, like you only need, you need all three signals to come in in order to, for you to produce a signal. Or you have A, B, but not C, then you produce a signal, and so forth. So we develop a system called BLADE. BLADE, what does it stand for? It stands for Boolean Logic and Arithmetic Through DNA Excisions. So basically, um, it's a way to uh, allow you to do almost any kind of Boolean logic, you know, uh, within a certain number of inputs and outputs. So the architecture in theory has no limitations, but in reality, of course, how good those enzymes work uh, is constrained by biology as usual. So what, what this is, is so the most fundamental system, it's a, uh, a two input, four output system. So whenever you think about two input logic, you actually have four unique states that you can actually achieve, okay? All the Boolean generate one output, right? We, we know from you know, our basic uh, physics studies, but in reality, if you generate four, if you have 
because you have four different states, if you generate four different outputs, you actually create something called a decoder. Okay. And we actually built that, a decoder, a two to four decoder in the mammalian cells. So this is the system. So how does it work? This is a recombinate based system. So again, we use a lot of these, uh, we rely on the, these uh, recombinase tricks that, that we got really good at. You can actually arrange these sites, okay, uh, like lock sites and, and FR, the, the sites for flip, such that you create four unique address. What's nice about it in, in mammalian cell is that this is the promoter that drives gene expression. It only drives the expression of the gene that's closest to it. If you have a gene afterwards, it won't get expressed. So basically, whichever gene that's very close to promoter, that gets expressed. And then if you supply, let's say, one of the recombinase CRE, what it does is that it will actually cut out the BFP. Let's say one of the first genes in the first slot, and then move the GFP next to it. So then it will actually produce GFP if you supply CRE. And then, if you only supply flip, for example, it actually cut out this whole fragment so that this uh, infrared RFP will get moved towards the promoter and that gets expressed. And finally, if you have both enzyme presence, it will basically cut out all these things and then move this M ruby, which is more like an orange fluorescent protein. Okay. So you can probably guess it works, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you this. So this is the data. This is the actual data in mammalian cells. So it's, um, it's probably as clean as a genetic circuit I've ever seen uh, in my life. So this is, uh, so basically uh, with no expression of Korean flip, you get BFP only, you get almost no BFP in any other state, and then similarly for these other states, you only see one signal. So this platform is extremely flexible. Basically, each slot, you can put many, many different things in it. You can put a termination sequence, GFP, or actually like GFP or a different fluorescent protein. You can actually put more than one protein in each slot. So that means you can not only have multiple inputs, you can have also multiple outputs. So these are multi-input, multi-output circuits. We use that to build more than 100 different uh, circuits using this platform. and I would say more than 70% of them behave as expected. So this is one of the largest synthesis of functionally distinct circuits uh, ever made. You can also put each slot, you can also put circuits in each slot. You're not restricted to put just genes in it. So in fact, we put something called buffer gate. And when you do that, you generate something called Boolean logic lookup table. So basically, this is a a, this one system right here encompasses all 16 possible Boolean logic, okay? And you get to choose which logic gate to display by choosing uh, whether you want to activate each of these systems in the middle. So this is another, f each one of these is controlled by four different recombinases. So there are six different recombinases in this system the six input, one output system. So um, just trust me, it works. Okay. Finally, I know I'm running out of time, but I still have an hour, hour and a half, right, Kathy? <laughs> last, last two slides. Um, you can actually, it doesn't really matter what these recombinases cut, whether it's cutting genes like <coughs> DNA that makes proteins or just cutting DNA that makes RNA and doesn't make any proteins. So for those of you who, who, who follow genetic engineering, there's this thing out there called CRISPR. Okay, it's an RNA guided uh, DNA, uh, RNA guided genome editing tool. So basically, uh, if you have a, a RNA called guy RNA, it has a, a specific, about like 20 base pair within the guy RNA, that is, uh, that's, you know, that can hybridize this to anywhere in the genome, or almost, almost anywhere. 
and that can bind to a protein called Cas9, and that actually allows it to uh, bind to the DNA that you specify in the guide RNA, and then actually it can cut DNA. But if you make it catalytically inactive so that it can cut DNA, it still remains the ability to bind genome as long as you, know, you have the guide RNA. And what's nice about it is that you can actually ta attach a transcription activation domain to Cas9, and that way you can basically guide the transcription activation domain to anywhere in the genome and initiate gene expression in anywhere in the genome. So we apply our uh, blade platform to control guide RNA expression that targets uh, four different genes in the, in the chromosomes. And these are the RT-PCR results that are uh, coming out of these uh, uh, expression from the endogenous genome. So what this does is that we now are not limited by outputs anymore. We can express as any genes, no matter how big it is, no matter it has like a thousand different introns or whatever it is, we can guide, use this guide on it to target it in the genome and then have it expressed. So that's, uh, that's all I have to say for today. And I want to acknowledge the people that's in my lab, uh, funding source, it's important. The NIH new innovator really saved my life. Uh, and then I got quite a bit of money also from, uh, from the College of Engineering as well. So thank you very much. I've quite, um, take questions now. Uh, no, no, please. So, uh, can you more explain about the, the threshold uh, modulator and the uh, uh, on-off switch? How are they different? Are they same or? Kind of, uh, yeah, the on-off switch. So, the, the, the threshold, it, it's almost, oh. So, the, it, it's almost the same, right? So, let, let me get, go back really quick. So if I don't put anything in, in one of the slots, then it's a on-off switch, basically. Right? If I don't have a low affinity receptor or high affinity receptor in one of these slots, it could be an on-to-off switches or off-to-on switch. So it's quite flexible. It really depends on what you want to do. So yeah. Ah. I'm just curious, like, how long it will take? To switch between things. Yeah. This is the, the $10 million grant that we are trying to uh, uh, figure that out. Um, ticks, the end, um, it could take very long time. It could take it looks great. days. Yeah, well, our experiment takes, like, two days. So initially, you see signal within a couple hours. But having good dynamic response, like, on off, take about a day or two. So, yes? You mentioned that it's not completely efficient when you're using the flip. How do you bet having half of them turned on, half of them turned off, or half of them on high, half of them on low? How do you then switch between both of them if you know, they're half high and half low? Yeah, so I, I worry about that. Um, the I guess the 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 simple answer is that we will try to get to a point where we don't get 50%. I think it's doable. It's about, it, it's something that we, we are, as a field, synthetic biology is very good at tuning expression and things like that, which is not there yet in human T cell. Um, for me, I think, let's say you go from a low affinity T cell, I mean, uh, from yeah, low affinity, high threshold T cell, even though not all of them switch, it's not a bad thing, right? You're just not as effective it won't hurt the patients. So I think that's a, that's my way of thinking about it. Even though, okay, we're up to like 70, 80%, it's not a bad thing, I think. Especially some of these cells, if they start proliferating and expanding, I don't think it's that big of a deal. You're having some of these uh, low, thresh, uh, low affinity car, high threshold car that's floating around, that's just not doing much. That's fine, I think those are okay. Yes. 
No, no, those were primary T cells. Those are human primary T cells. So uh, a lot of the stuff, it's in JerkCat um, because I have to screen of a lot of different var uh, var varieties. But the, 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 uh, the interferon gamma is from primary T cell. Are the um, inputs to your computer, you know, the Cree and, mm -hmm. and the flip, are those, uh, I, are, how, do you, how do you generate those? How do you yeah, so right now we, 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 we just either supply the plasma that expresses the, 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 the recombinases or not. But we, we actually got really good recently at using different drugs to control the expression and the localizations and recruitments. We try everything under the sun pretty much to control these guys. So we've gotten pretty good. Next thing we're trying to do is hook them up to, let's say, uh, let's say hypoxia responsive elements or, or pH responsive elements so that it can sense things that are more relevant to tumor microenvironment. Yes. So those are hard. <laughs> those are hard to do. Yes. So when you design the orthogonal monitors on the CAR T cells, yeah. how can you make them truly orthogonal rather than all the endogenous um, like receptor antibody interaction being in a more complex in vivo environment? And also, how can, are they like immunogenic? Are they causing a problem? <laughs> Why you ask these hard questions? Uh, I'm, I am, optimistic that they are orthogonal to everything else. These are, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't say yet what they are, so, but I'm fairly optimistic that you don't find them outside the cell, let's just say that. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, you, you don't really know are they truly orthogonal or they will all of a sudden binding to uh, something that's on like healthy tissue surface. Right, without any antibody. Those, you, you, you just kind of have to find out. But those were chosen such that those are proteins are not found outside of the cell. Um, so that's one thing. Now immunogenicities, we do try to find you know, things that are um, mammalian or human, think, that's, that's normally found in human and mammalians. You never know, right, anytime you make junctions, like you make a new fusion protein, that junction is immunogenic. Um, I haven't figured out a way <laughs> to avoid that yet. Um, we w we're actually working on trying to figure out how to deal with these immunogenicities. Uh, I think it will help a lot, not just in car space, but also in transplant as well. Um, but no, I haven't figured it out. <laughs> well, let's uh, uh, thank... Uh, before you go, to, uh, there's a closing couple of comments here by our, uh, our leader. Thank you. <laughs> so quickly, I just want to thank everyone who came today and everyone on the live stream for joining us. And um, if we could thank all the speakers one more time, I'd appreciate that. Um, and I'd also like to reiterate, uh, thank again the BU Nano Center for um, providing our lunch and helping us out with the room. Um, and to thank Lena, Helen, Stefan, and Bennett for helping us put this day together. And the last thing is that I need to have all the evaluations that are in your folders um, filled out. So if you could fill them out and hand them to the person sitting at the table as you walk out, um, that would be great. And if you need to fill out the CME credit form, if you're a physician, um, that form is also in the folder and you also hand it to the person um, outside the door. If you would like any more information about the CFTCC, we have uh, a website, which is um, bu.edu slash cftcc and at that site um, there are all of these events are that we live stream are archived there so if you want to look under the events tab um, in a few days you'll be able to see these talks if there were some today that you wanted to see that you missed and um, we also have an opportunity to gain input from clinicians on our website. You'll notice on the homepage um, and some other places there are these little short YouTube videos um, that clinicians have um, recorded for us at their desk. They're two minutes long. And there are also some instructions there about how to record those. And the, the, purposes of, the purpose of these videos are um, folks giving us an idea about what their personal challenges are in the clinic in terms of um, treating cancer 
cancer patients and monitoring cancer patients in the clinic. So if you're a clinician, you're interested in doing that, um, go right ahead and do it. And if you need help, um, you can send me or Helen an email and we can help you um, find help with doing that. So um, thank you everyone for coming. This officially closes the session.